Okay, we are live. Welcome, my gentle and very modern apes, back to this show that isn't really a show. This isn't meant to be like a series or anything like that. This is supposed to be um, something along the lines of a, a an impromptu coverage where we together kind of um, imbibe this stupidity that has been wrought upon us. Now, in case you forgot, yesterday, or weren't able to make it, yesterday we covered the beginnings of a document that was given to me by Standing for Truth, the creationist, meaning to be an answer to a series of critiques that I gave for his attempt to delineate in the human fossil record which of these hominins were of the ape kind and which were of the human kind. Obviously, the, the, the situation was wrought with problems. None of the criteria actually worked, but you can see the last video for the coverage of that. Today, we're covering the very hilarious and funny attempt at raw map, the actual author of the document. Saying for truth is just the peddler, the dealer, if you will. But raw map is the author, and raw map, known academic fraud here on YouTube, has attempted to answer the series of questions that I posed to this particular group of creationists a couple months ago. I was basically like, I'm done interacting with you guys because you're really being bad faith, something that you, my lovely chat, um, like sort of an, an albatross, what is that, a canary in the coal mine. Like a canary in the coal mine warned me about much earlier than I realized uh, that I was dealing with what was essentially a very grifty channel. So Standing and I had it out, and, um, and, and when I said that I was going to cover this horrific attempt at delineating the, the hominin and uh, like the hominin kinds into human and ape, Standing not only said that his answer was good, he proposed this document, but then he also urged me to check out the updated document. The updated document of which he had given permission to Raw Matt, I suppose Raw Matt is the author, I'm, I'm assuming the grammar is a dead ringer from Raw Matt, um, that, that he supposes answers my questions. Now, I had a long list of questions. The list of questions were essentially um, going through the problems I have with Young Earth Creationism, the things that I think preclude it outright, um, and answers that I think creationists must give if they really do want to have that seat at the table with scientists. Um, now, as you can see, I'm in a tank top today. That's because I <laughs> worked out. As you can see, I am uh, I am quite <laughs> ripped. I'm cut. Um, so I'm, I've got my water here, actually, instead of tea. I was, I was getting ready to make the tea, and then I was like, man, I'm not in the mood for something hot. I was just outside, you know, sweating and crying while I ran. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we begin, I would like to see who's hanging out in the chat. So I'm going to, to hop on over to the stream and see who's hanging. Um, Mikkel Koning says, Ramat has all degree except in language. No, I'm pretty sure he has a degree in language too. It's just like, um, he's just got the BS in that one. The rest are all PhDs. That one's just a BS though. Oh, Tangelo Grasshole is here. We do love to see, uh, uh, what is a very uh, compelling, very accurate interpretation of some of Otangelo's mannerisms. But I do suspect the real Otangelo will show up as well. Scott Duke is here. Lucas here. We've got a lot of folks. I'm so glad that everyone is here. Josiah is here. Again, go check out Josiah's shirt. Josiah, please plug it in the side chat as I work out my bank stuff. Um, I, I really appreciate Otangelo referring to <laughs> Otangelo Grasshole, the, the the sort of mock account of Otangelo referring to me as a witch. Um, I, I've gotten a great deal of enjoyment out of all of the, um, I guess they're meant to be mean nicknames from some of the members of the Brain Trust. By some of the members, I mean, mostly it's just John Maddox calling me like a Medusa and a snake. Um, not like a Gorgon, right? Like the mythical creature, the Gorgon, but Medusa, the character, which I, th I think is quite funny. I always get a kick out of that. So hello, everyone. Uh, Vesta's here. Adrian's here. David Neff is here. Maddie Field is here. Tesla Ranger. We got a whole bunch of good folks. Azula is here. Um, molecular, uh, molecular, uh, molecular Alchemy is here. Hello, Molecular Alchemy. That guy knows his stuff. Uh, Kevin is here. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you think uh, I'm amazing. Yes, Nestle guy, I've been called Medusa, the, the, the Greek monster by a couple of, of the creationists. And by a couple, I mean, it's just John Maddox. He's just, he's just being a big old baby as usual. And, you know, getting, um, I think the kids call it triggered. <laughs> um, but today I regret to inform you that the answers, the attempted answers to, to the questions that I have posed are actually 
some of them are stupider by an order of magnitude when compared to what we were dealing with yesterday. So if you need to take a moment and go get a drink, um, something that is maybe strong or spiked, it is the afternoon, um, it's five o'clock somewhere, uh, but you might want to go do that. Because again, we're, we're going to be dealing with some very frustrating um, levels of competence here today. Uh, is that even physically possible? Yes, it is. And you are going to see what I mean. Uh, Sunflower, he's noteworthy too, r right? <laughs> I, I guess he, oh, Sunflower, I didn't see you earlier. You were referring to yourself. Yes, hello, Sunflower, and welcome. We like to see Sunflower. He's 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 a guy we we, we enjoy see, having his company around. Andrea says, when you say BS, you mean Bachelor of Science or Master of Blood. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, could be either. Yeah, Mikkel, time to break out the 100 proof. Yeah, I'm installing, but but we do have to get um we do have to sink our teeth into this, sink our our reduced canines and in, into the mess that this is, because it it is going to be a lot. Nessica said, perhaps they call you that since whenever they see you upload another debunking video, it makes their heart stop and it feels like they're being petrified. I like to think that that's the case, but the the, the reality is probably more like when, at least from John Maddox's side, when woman says mean thing, um is a monster. I, I like to think that that is kind of what's going on there. I've had it on a, a couple of different authorities and experiences that he does not seem to be a huge fan of uh, women that disagree with him, or men for that reason, for that um, matter. But he seems to be a bit more vitriolic in some cases towards the ladies. But eh, what are you going to do? Yeah, Leo. Hello, Leo Phileas. Welcome. Yeah, he says he's going to start chugging the Everclear. You know, that might be the play, honestly. Um, I'm going to show you what I mean. We're going to jump right into it because there's, as you can see, my tabs at the top. We will be visiting all of these tabs. That's that's what we're dealing with here. That's the level. Um, I'm going to be checking in with the chat every now and again. Um, but please, if you want something specific to say something specifically to me, at me at Gutsy Gibbon, so it black flashes in my face and I can see it. Um, let's <laughs> let's hop into this. So I'm going to share the screen here, and um, and we're gonna we're gonna get messy. So this is the document. Now, if you'll remember. <laughs> This document was originally like 12 pages or something very small like that. I think I have it done. No, I don't have it down there. It was a very small document initially. And um, when Standing for Truth and Raw Matt found out that I was going to be covering it, I caught Raw Matt in the wee hours of the night whilst enjoying, uh, as I said yesterday, an episode of Chopped, a bunch of episodes of Chopped. Um, he starts live editing it and just feverishly adding things. Oh, yes, we've answered. Oh, yes, we've answered this, this, and this. Um, and standing very confidently said to me, Heh, what do you mean we haven't answered your questions? I even took screenshots of them. So, you know, thank God we've got the, the screenshots from the actual video here. So I don't actually have to go back and forth and tell you what the questions are. So I'll be reading Raw Matt. Uh, Raw Matt actually covered this <sighs> per se. Um, or like a, what was the word, like verbatim, and we will we will jump right into this. Now, these questions I want you to think to yourself. Think to yourself if if you're sitting down and you see this question in front of you, how you would answer it, right? Because there's a very there's going to be a bias in how um, robust and <laughs> comprehensive some of the answers to this are. Sometimes Ramat will give, like for this first question, he really goes hard on this one. I like to think that he was like, <laughs> I'm gonna be going through all these questions. There's gonna be like 10 pages per question. And then he got tuckered out and decided that only the first question will have a lot of text to it and the rest will be rather pithy. So this is actually going to be the longest one out of the, out of the lot of them. And I was thinking it might be fun if when we finish the question, if you guys can tell me if you think he answered it or not. Uh, because Stand for Truth is very keen on saying, we'll just let the audience decide. And I'm like, thank God my audience doesn't really watch your videos. They don't have an overlap with yours. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. It's uh, There's not going to be much watching both sides and then deciding you guys can't afford that level of uh, brain rot and neither can I. I'm just a masochist. Um, so <laughs> now to show that we have addressed all of the things Erica claims we have not addressed. Ready? 
more than you could ever know, Ramat. So the first question I asked is that creationists need to be able to denote a, legit a legitimate genetic line for the kinds. If you're new here and you don't know what a kind is, a kind is what young Earth creationists suppose is the limit of natural selection, mutation, and evolution. So they think, yes, we see natural selection today, it happens, whatever, big whoop, but there is some kind of line that precludes common ancestry. Um, and then they also go to Genesis and they're like, see, he said he created them after their kind. Um, and then the same word is used to describe like species <laughs> in like a couple books later. So it's, it's very inconsistent biblically, um, but then the Bible is not a textbook, is it? A uh, science textbook, is it? So my challenge was to come up with a genetic line to separate the kinds because from a genetic standpoint, life is a gradient. There is no clear slate where you can say, this is where one species ends and the next species begins, or rather, I, I guess a better way of putting it would be clade, a group of organisms ends and the next one begins, full stop, natural selection can't work that work past that point. Um, and the example that I always give is that creationists will be very happy to say that dogs are a kind and bears are a kind. But then what do you do with the amphicyonids? Amphicyonids, amphicyonids, amphicyonids are bear dogs. Uh, they're extinct now, unfortunately, because they were big old absolute unit cuties. Um, but bear dogs have the morphologic characteristics of both dogs and bears. And this is because something that was quite similar to an amphicyonid gave rise to both of those lineages. So because creationists believe all organism kinds were created at once, an amphicyonid would have to exist at the same time as the progenitor kind for the dogs and for the cats. So how do you genetically tell that, or for the, uh, sorry, the dogs and the, and the um, bears? So how do you tell the difference between the dog kind, the bear dog kind, and the bear kind genetically. What does that line look like? That was the question that I asked. Now, the funny thing about Ramat is that he's real hung up on this one. Ramat is also the kind of guy who really doesn't want to be monkey. He says, not monkey, every chance he gets, at least standing will be like, yeah, a little monkey, you know, not evolved from monkey, but monkey. Ramat doesn't do that. He's he he really doesn't like being like he he specifically will be like I'm not even a primate, which is very funny um, and very sad because being a primate is awesome. So let's look at the attempt made by Ramat to to delineate the kinds um, because you have to admit that humans are indeed apes. Ramat doesn't do that, but Standing does. So we'll just kind of we're going to argue with Ramat though because Standing is kind of irrelevant to to this other than kind of poking fun at him. Um, and why are humans not in the same kind as chimps and bonobos? Because no matter how you draw that metric, if you're going to group the cat kinds and the dog kinds together, humans and chimps are going to be together genetically. Full stop, period. We're 98.8% identical in our base coding base pairs. That's what actually does the things that make you you um, and make you a, a human. Um, and so, so that therein lies the problem. So first he starts off with this gangbuster sentence. The taxonomic boundary paradox already draws the line. The taxonomic boundary paradox was a problem that only applied to Linnaean taxonomy, which was superseded by phylogenetics decades ago. I'm not kidding. We're starting off with something so dumb that I, I can't help but think that Ramat doesn't know what the taxonomic boundary paradox actually is. Um, for instance, if we do a quick Google search, the tax, look, I've already, I did this earlier, which is why I want to show you how easy it is. So you even got pictures, how easy it is to actually find what you're looking for here. The taxonomic boundary paradox refers to the conflict between traditional rank-based classification of life and living things. And over in the contents, the resolution is part three and talks about how phylogeny, phylogenetics, and the understanding of what a monophyletic group is, and the understanding that an ancestor and all of its lineages are indeed a monophyly, solved the problem. <laughs> the solution is provided by cladistic classification in which each group is composed of an ancestor and all its descendant populations called a monophyly. So this, this is something that was fixed again decades ago, but Ramat is a creationist, so I can't help but wonder if he pulled this out of like a dusty book from an ancient library uh, that was like um, in the same phrase talking about how we'll never solve um, orbital mechanics. You know, it's it's insane to me. So the taxonomic boundary paradox is not a thing. That's that's something that we need to 
appreciate right off the bat. Um, so no, it does not already draw a line. But then again, I don't think Romat could define phylogenetics. But let's into the ge get into the genetics, shall we? I love that. The first easy way to draw a line is by looking at mutation rates and seeing where they go. Mutation rates are important, but when it comes to deciding, genetically speaking, what is related to what, a full genomic comparison is usually the best practice. That's how paternity tests work. If you're trying to figure out who is the father, right, you're not looking at their mutation rates. You're looking at their genome. You're looking at variable portions of it and seeing who matches with it, right? Now, mutation rates can be important in showing what that genome looks like, because if you're picking a highly conserved area of the genome, they'll all look like they're your dad. Uh, but if they are, if you're looking at something that's highly variable, changes, you know, every two or three generations, it's going to be pretty easy to tell who the dad is. Mutation rates are important, but they are not actually what we're comparing in, con in comparative genomics. We're comparing what we see, the genome. How that genome got to be that way, different story entirely. You see the mitochondria ticks faster, or sorry, let me, let me get it how he's saying it. You see, comma, raw mat, the mitochondria ticks fast, far too fast for evolution to be true. No citation, no argument, nothing. This is coming directly from replacing Darwin, which we will touch on later. No matter what organism you look at, it doesn't matter. Of course, this makes me think he didn't read Replacing Darwin because Nathaniel Jensen had problems with three of his seven organisms outright. Uh, these mutation rates alone point to a recent bottleneck that undermine and undermine evolution. You see, it was evolution that never expected such little diversity in all life when tested. It was a shocker, actually. It wasn't. I mean, some people had strong feelings about it, but like Raw Matt likes to create this big soap opera, soap opera style drama in his head where it's like, they're like, oh my God, we, the mutation rates are fast, but, but evolution, how could it be true? No, we must, we must continue to preserve naturalism at all costs. And that's like really dumb and proves to me at least that Raw Matt has not been within 30 feet of a scientist ever. <laughs> Why? Because if evolution were true, nothing would share so much similarity. Again, that's insane to me. There are highly conserved portions of the, of the genome. That's how we know all life goes back to a common ancestor because there are aspects that everything on earth shares. That's like a very basic concept. That is why in the 60s, they predicted things would not share much similarity because deep time would have separated them too much to find any um, citation needed. Lo and behind, they now use genetic similarity as their best evidence for evolution when in reality it was a falsification of the theory citation needed. Um, but let's take a look at what happened. Yes, let us look at the sources, Ramat. I love when he brings things to the table because he can sit there and say all he wants. I can sit here and say all I want. But if neither of us are bringing sources to the table to show the methodology, to show what we're looking at, um, it doesn't really matter. It's bubkis. So let's take a look at what happened using DNA barcoding. I hope Rational Mind is in the chat because Rational Mind, you're going to love this section. And without me saying anything, read what they say as I lay it out for you, Ramad has taken us on a journey. So this here, I'm, I'm not sure about this section, but this here is from this paper um, by Stokely, Stokel, um, and Thaler. Now, I want to point something out to you right off the bat. At the very top of this paper, note added by authors December 4th, 2018, this study is grounded in and strongly supports Darwinian evolution, including the understanding that all life has evolved from a common biological origin over several billion years. This work follows mainstream views of human evolution. We do not propose there was a single Adam or Eve. We do not propose any catastrophic events. This note doesn't exist on any other paper and is only here because of the absolute... Um, bungling that creationists have done with trying to use this paper to support themselves. The, the authors were genuinely like, we need to put a disclaimer here like you would for a baby so that it doesn't hurt itself. Um, that's, that's what we're dealing with right off the bat. But 
whether what they say doesn't matter because raw map will always 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 cry conspiracy let's look at what they actually found so the co one barcode, var barcode variation within avian species is uniformly low regardless of the census population size. This finding directly contradicts a central prediction of neutral theory and is not readily accounted for by commonly proposed ad hoc modifications. As an alternative model, consistent with empirical data, including the molecular clock, we propose extreme purifying selection, including at synonymous sites, limits variation within species, and continuous adaptive evolution drives the molecular clock. Reasonable. I think that's a reasonable statement. Now, I'm not a geneticist, gadunch, but I think that this sounds like a, a reasonable claim to make, supposing that they back it up in their actual methodology. This is in the conclusion, so this is the conclusion they've reached. Then he uh, does another like cutoff here. This is not related to this, which is funny to me. They're from the same paper, but I don't know. He, he decided to take the second one uh, and include it here and highlight a portion, even though we don't have the beginning of the sentence. First impulse, seek a complex and multifaceted explanation for one of the clearest, most data-rich and general facts in all of evolution. The simple hypothesis is that the same explanation offered for sequence variation found among modern humans applies equally to the modern populations of essentially all other animal species, namely that the extent population, no matter what its current size or similarity to fossils of any age, has expanded from mitochondrial uniformity within the past 200,000 years. Um, so the gist of what they're actually saying is, you may have heard this being circulated around quite some time ago, but the gist is that this paper is proposing that most, if not all life, has its mitochondrial origin around 200,000 years ago. Now, my first thought when I saw this was, okay, it's a species turnover rate. No, no species today, to my knowledge, is exactly the same as it was 200,000 years ago, genetically speaking. So there has to be a time as mutations accumulate in different populations where your organism, like, you know, stasis is a thing, but it's it's more for gross features rather than the actual genome in and of itself. Um, there's going to be a turnover where all the species are replaced, right? A, a period of time where it takes this long on average for all the species to turn over and replace. Um, and by my understanding, that's what this would look like. Okay. Cool. <laughs> That's great. Um, I don't know why he thinks that helps him either since 200,000 years. Like, let's say he's proposing, let's say the authors come out and they're like, ah, they came out of nowhere, which isn't what they said. Right. But let's just say they did. Um, that's 200,000 years ago, right? Like that's 100,000 or 199,000 um, or 193,000 like years too many for young earth creationism at 6,000 years. Still doesn't work. Um, but those things aren't given. So the simple hypothesis is that the explanation offered for sequence variation found among modern humans applies equal to, okay, we already read that. Wait, did he just repeat that? Yeah, yeah, this is just this. Awesome. Second, there's no trace of the geological record in the, geolo uh, in the geological record of any global event, singular, in the last 200,000 years, any event that slashed populations that significantly would surely have led to a noticeable spike in extinction rate, and there isn't one. Um, right, that is in line with what I just said, though. You don't have to have extinction for for uh, kind of a genome turnover, right, for what you're actually seeing. Species change and adapt. They don't have to go extinct to yield something new, if that makes sense. But now we enter into the realm of barcoding. And before we do this, because this is my favorite part of this whole deal, because it is just so bad. Um, I'm going to check in with the comments and see what everybody's, see what everybody is, uh, how everyone's hanging over there. Let's see here. Got to stop the old screen share. See what's going on. Yeah, Rational Mind says it's also mitochondrial ancestor for species, not kinds, which would have to be much older. Yes, uh, that's an excellent point that I had not considered. Holy sh! we have 119 people watching. Welcome! Please, um, I don't know, like, like, comment, and subscribe, and, you know, hit the button. <laughs> hit the bell. Hmm. Okay, um, anybody else saying uh, cool stuff over here? Creationists never argue kinds or species, so what's Matt's point? That's a great question. No, Mikkel, you should not take a shot every time the word kind flies by. I will not be responsible for um, your undoing. Nestlig, bear, no pun intended, in mind huh, that Ramat once claimed that cats are descended from myocids, which are also the ancestors of dogs and bears. Of course they deleted that quickly. Oh boy. 
baby, you don't even know what's coming. You guys don't even know what's coming. Ugly German truth, is there any point of touching replacing Darwin except to carry it with two fingers over to the next trash can? Um, evisceration has already been dealt to replacing Darwin from every single angle. You're going to want to check out uh, Creation Myths video last night where yet another factor came and just brutally hacked Jensen's work to death in the backyard. Um, the police came and weren't even sure that it was Jensen. That's how unidentifiable it was. Um, thank you, Luca. I, you know, I'm always surprised that people want to hear what I have to say. So I, I, I do love to, I do love to hear this. Um, Christmas is here and, uh, hello, Dan, what's up? Scott, how do you have a conversation with a person who believes in a 6,000 year old earth? Um, you do so with Rom, in Romat's case, you do so like you're talking to a small child. Um, and I say that because I haven't had very many interactions with Ramat, but based off of his reading, the comprehension is low. So I'm not, you know, maybe he's a smart guy and he's just really, 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 really uninformed on this topic. And by topic, I mean series of topics that he's trying to make a living off of. So great. Yeah, Christian, this, this is another spicy stream. I'm, I'm actually going to be a little bit meaner than normal, maybe even a little meaner than yesterday, because this feels like an even greater waste of my time because he had time to edit this. He had time to edit this and make it the best that it could be. And this is what we got. And you're going to see what I mean. Um, I am watching James Smith. I'm watching because your voice makes my skin crawl. Just kidding. I could listen to you all day. In fact, I have. That is very sweet. I um. I, there was a time when I was insecure about my voice because it is very nasally and high pitched. But I've you know I've grown to love myself. What are you gonna do? Um. Let's hop back over. Um. Because this is uh. Now we now we enter the fray. Now we enter the fray. I have created. PowerPoint for you guys <laughs> to go along with this experience. Um, so let's talk about barcoding. Barcoding is essentially a type of comparative genomics. And I'm telling you this because you need to know all of this information before we dive into it. Ramat doesn't know it, but you should because it's cool to know anyways. Um, yeah, so, so DNA barcoding is essentially like you can take a whole genome and compare it to another whole genome and see how they compare to tell how closely related they are or how similar they are, or even judge a mutation rate if you're you know, doing like something uh, along the lines of a pedigree, right? You can also do it with genes. You can do it with specific genes, right? You can take two genes and compare them and see how one gene has changed over time based off of when they diverged. You can also do it with portions of a gene because genes have different mutation rates sometimes depending on the portion of the gene that you're looking at. DNA barcoding, takes a look at a gene called the CO1 gene. Uh, cytosine oxidase 1, I believe. Cytosine oxidase 1. I've been calling it CO1 in my head and when I'm explaining it, forcing my fiance to listen to me explain it. Um, so CO1, the CO1 gene. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the CO1 gene. Don't look at this. This is the end. We're talking about radiometric dating later. So why do we barcode with the CO1 gene and its locality? So the CO1 gene is universal to eukaryotes. Everyone's got it. All of us multicellular dudes have it, which is great. Uh, the size and structure is around 1,600 base pairs. So those base pairs are your nucleotides, right? They're going to be your uh, ATGC. And it's just a big stretch of 1,600. Um, and some of it is very conserved. And some of it is very variable. Um, and that 648 base pair locality experiences this kind of fast mutation rate, which makes it really, really easy to distinguish between species because within species, they're going to be very similar. So if you took a, a dog and a wolf, right, they would have a similar CO1 gene in part, right, that was very, very uh, ancestral and um, basal and ancient. But that 648 base pair locality is going to differ a bit. Um, and, you know, I think it's a good way to, to do some comparative genomics. That's an interesting thing to do. There's some criticisms, but I think that it's good for what I know about genetics, which isn't great. I'm not an amazing geneticist, but I did the work for this. So, so keep with me. The gene also comprises this wide range of different functional domains showing heterogeneous substitution patterns. It's easy to amplify because there's a high copy number because it's in the mitochondria. Um, and it's got limited exposure to um, recombination because I believe it's like a haploid thing. So that's cool. And then this is where I got the that information from the marker choice, unexpected resolving power of unexplored CO1 uh, region for layered DNA and barcoding approaches. 
let me make sure because I know y'all are in the chat. Rational Mind, Cytochrome oxidase one. Dang it. Thank you, Rational Mind. Rational Mind does this stuff. Um, and, and he knows that much better than I do. It, was that an okay explanation, I guess, Rational Mind? You, you tell me. Um, but let's continue. So this is something to remember from later, for later. Put a pin in this, because this is from Rock et al. In, in 2017, that paper that I just mentioned over here. And I used, I, I hope you appreciate this, this intentional, I'm, I'm channeling my inner raw mat here with the underlinings. But of course, I also gave my source, so therein lies the difference. So thus, it is not remarkable that the former region of the CO1 performed well for identification and assignment of samples in some taxonomic groups. For example, birds, fish, and mammals, but failed in various other groups, bilaterian animals, um, and gastropods and amphibians and wide range of marine invertebrates and insects. So uh, clams, snails, most frogs and salamanders, insects and echinoderms and nidarians and things like that. It doesn't work great for any of them. Um, you can make it work. I've, I, in my deep dive, I kind of saw uh, some, some workarounds. You can, you can get it to work, but the, the traditional way of just doing it doesn't seem to track very well for these animals in particular. So keep that in mind. Let's see what's Rational Mind saying that I did okay. Yeah, decent explanation. Okay, thank you, Rational Mind. That I, again, this is not at all. I do, I do extant primates and their behavior and their like morphology uh, and ecology. I don't. The genetics aren't my thing, but I'm doing my best. So I've stolen these slides from Rational Mind's video on Jackson Wheat's channel. Um, I've stolen some of them. Some of them are new. I've stolen eh, half. And um, that's because they're great slides. So you should check out that, that video. It's in the link in the description of the last video. So you can get these barcodes from the Barcode of Life system and you can check it for yourself. Rational Mind's in the chat and he did it. And when he did it, he found that in comparing that specific region of the CO1 gene, you have 93 base pair differences between the jackal and the fox. Okay, you might think that's, that's a couple of differences, I guess. They're still pretty similar. Um, and cats and lions, they have an 82 base pair difference. Okay, well, you might think that's that's interesting that cats and lions are more similar genetically, had perhaps a, a more um, uh, recent divergence time than, than the jackals and the foxes, but whatever, that's cool. Keep these numbers in mind. For humans and chimps and bonobos, this is what we get. 65 base pair difference between humans and chimps with a 23 base pair difference between chimps and bonobos. So humans are more similar using this barcoding region to chimps, common chimps, so pentroglodytes and, and the uh, subspecies therein, uh, than jackals are to foxes or cats are to lions. This is the whole point of the phylogeny challenge, right? And then like the specific version that I tend to use which is come up with a way to delineate the kinds that doesn't land humans with the rest of the hominids. So I'm th if you're thinking like me, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, okay, so raw mat's got two options. He can go for really big inclusive kinds and accept that humans are hominids, or he can go for really, really tiny kind groups to separate humans from the rest of the hominids. Those are his only two options here, right? Those are the only ways to be consistent. And because this is a gene for um, cellular respiration, the, the CO1 gene, it's doing the same thing. It's doing the same kind of thing, right? So you, you do have to be consistent with your assessment here. So I'm wondering what Ramad is going to do. So let's see, you know, let's see what old Ramad has to say about all this. First to keep in mind too, and uh, um, Rational Mind also sussed this out, but in Ramad's video about DNA barcoding from months and months and months ago, back when I believe, uh, you know, everything was still kicking up crazy style of back in March, Rombat took a human like barcode and then overlaid it or not overlaid it, but placed it on top of a gorilla barcode to show how different they are. But then when Rational Mind went and did it for himself, this is what he got from the bold database, from the, the barcode of life database. Um, so, let us keep in mind not just potential incompetence, but also potential dishonesty uh, in the back of our brains here. Um, let us also consider, and these are what Rational Mind did as well, if you make the threshold 60 nucleotides, right, which would be the difference between uh, the, like your, your, your uh, threshold to separate humans from the chimps. You've got to be within 60 base pairs in order to be within the same kind. That's cool, but this is being the super, super duper exclusive like kind categorization. 
And if you know creationists, this bites them in the ass when you have to put all these MFs on the ark. You can't fit them all. This is why Answers in Genesis puts it roughly at the family level. They've been very open about that. So exclusive is going to be problematic down the line, which is why they tend to be very, very reluctant to do that. This is what happens if you do it with cats. Look how many different kinds you get for the cats, right? You may be able to separate humans, genus Pan, genus Gorilla, and genus Pongo, but you're also getting different genera for like every other cat, right? So it's problematic. This is also from Rational Mind. You get 81 differences between these two individuals here. I believe that's a swift fox and a finnick fox. Um, and then you get 81 differences between, I think that's a fisher cat and a regular cat. And then 65 from uh, Ken Ham and, and a chimp. Now, granted, Ken Ham is a bit more simian looking than some, but what are you going to do? Uh, I, think, I think it's his face shape, honestly. So what's Raw Matt's solution here, right? What are we thinking? In the side chat, if you think he's going to do something dumb, put a one. If you think he's going to do something smart, get out of here. You know what's going to happen. Um, last thing from Rational Mind before we delve into what Ramat has done. This is an additional problem for the, the, the very, very, very exclusive kinds because you'll have 58 nucleotide differences between tigers and lions, 45 between lions and jaguars, and then 73 between tigers and jaguars. So you essentially have to make the threshold 73 if you want them all in the same kind. So what has raw mat done? Well, raw mat opts for inclusive kind. So let's hop over here so you can see. First, we got to read some of the other dumb shit that he said first. Why would all that land, air, and aquatic life die in a worldwide bottleneck that they do not even have evidence for in their made-up geologic column? Because genetic evidence is undeniable. This is him bitching again about the 200,000 years ago potential species turnover rate. Um, or, you know, also, why would it be a single geologic bottleneck? Like, for instance, the, the Devonian extinction was a real slow burn. We see it in the geologic record, but if you were there, you might not even know it's happening. You see, this is what happens when evidence contradicts the story. They are at a loss of words because it's such a shock. Again, this is like soap opera nonsense. The reality is mtDNA ticks fast and nothing, not even a single pedigree mutation rate study, put a pin in this, comes anywhere close to a 200,000 year bottleneck that they believed must have happened. Why? Because it was not 200,000 years ago and mutation rates are way faster than they need. Yeah, this is, I hope it's clear why this is dumb, but let's continue because we, we've got a lot to cover uh, and we'll, we'll come back to these pedigree mutation rates later. The CL1 gene was not tested using observable pedigree rates either. It was inferred like all the rest. What does the observable data show? And then this is them just saying there's mitochondrial, maybe mitochondrial hyperdiver hyperdiversity uh, across eukaryotes than, than currently known. The real truth, as we'll find out, is that it's really variable. <laughs> so shocking, I know. Then he does, he shows us this guy right here. Um, I believe this is from the same paper. High mitochondrial DNA mutation rates may be more frequently linked to high diversity, blah, blah, blah. So just in the possibility of high mutation rates. Yes, thank you once again for telling us that, Raw Matt. Then he presents this paper. This is Kumar and, or Kumar and Subramanian that talks about mutation rates being similar uh, among all mammals when mutation rates per year, when looking at uh, mutation rates per year and not per generation. Now, this is from 2012, which is fine, right? Let me find the, what I was looking for, because I have a couple of tabs up here I'm going to have to go through. Um, this is the paper that he's talking about. This is a paper from 2002. So I thought, hmm, I, well, I wonder if any more recent work has been done on that. Uh, and it has. And this is from 2008. Strong variations of mitochondrial mutation rate across mammals, the longevity hypothesis. So this idea is that, yeah, some have very fast mitochondrial rates, some it's slower than expected, some it's faster than expected, and that's just the reality of life and the pressures that act upon it. So, you know, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, Ramat is not ever up to date on the literature. Um, this is interesting too. We propose that natural selection tends to decrease the mitochondrial mutation rates in long-lived species in agreement with the mitochondrial theory of aging. So if the rate is decreasing in long-lived species, put a pin in that too, because humans live a really long time. So let's, let's consider both of these things uh, in tandem as we move on. 
So they assume the mutation rate in the CO1 gene is very slow and it's all based on the assumptions of deep time. I went ahead and just like Googled like the CO1 gene um, and it's suitable for the role as being barcoding because the mutation rate is often fast enough to distinguish closely related species. Bare minimum, wrong again, right off the bat. Nothing observable about it. Their rate of change is an assumed 1% per million or 40 changes per 1,000 base pairs over 1 million years. Now, this is something that I think is funny here. We're going to talk about this little comparison that he's done here, but I'm also going to check in with the old Chatterini and see what's going on. How much is Ramat's bank account considered when he writes and defends these arguments? I don't think he makes all that much money, honestly, from, from what he does. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of ones. Especially when you get into arthropods. Yeah, true, brain bug. True. Um, let's see, ugly German truth. Yeah, he could also use method three, lie, and be inconsistent. Yep, no one ever accuses Bert mad of being honest. Yeah, he's never he's never had that insult lobbed at him, to be sure. Um, let's see. Okay, rational mind isn't roasting me, which means I'm doing okay, I guess. So we'll continue. All right. So here's some barcode tests, some CO1 barcode alignments for... Bovids and, or rather just a, a classic, I believe it's just Bos Taurus, like the, the classic cow, and a honeybee right here. Don't be confused because he included the bovine and the hummingbird, and then he says they're 80% identical along the aligned region. He doesn't show it, but keep that number in mind. Then he looks at the bovine CO1 supposedly separated by more than 700 million years and are seven or 67% identical. Well, that's kind of interesting because that tells us that the bovine, the cow, and the hummingbird are more similar than the cow and the bee. That kind of boy, that kind of matches, you know, human ev or uh, evolutionary theory. And boy, isn't it kind of interesting that we're looking at what looks to be the entire CO1 gene? You know, the one where half of it is highly conserved? Hmm. Boy, that would lead to high similarity up to 50%, right? And then differences after that. Again, not genetics, but this, is, this seems to follow to me. Then he does it with nematodes, and he finds that the similarity between um, cows and nematodes is around 60%, um, which he doesn't actually show, interestingly enough, but whatever. And then he does the same with fungi, and he has that they're 62.76%. I'm, I'm curious about this 60% thing. I'm, I'm curious why he hasn't included that. And because um, you, you would imagine, you would think that cows and nematodes would be more similar than, than cows and certain fungi. But, you know, that's that 2.76 is, is not extreme by any means. It certainly is not like, problematic. I'm mostly just curious to see if he's gotten that right. And I couldn't find, I, I signed up for a or barcode of life, but I'm still waiting to be approved. So here's his whole point. Ramat is mad. He he's upset because he thinks they should be more different. But again, most of the gene, or not most of the gene, half, up to half of the gene is conserved. It's 1,600 base pairs. And 648 of them are the part that we look at for the, the locality of the CO1 gene. So I don't know, like this is another example of Ramat not knowing how genetics works. Now, I don't really know how genetics works, but I, I do the work to try and understand it. And um, let's see what's going on over here. Nestle Ramat used the 60NT difference threshold for kinds, but when pointed out that cats differ by more, he says it's due to different environments and domestication. Yeah, we'll 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 touch on that here soon. Um, because it's it's really, really funny. <laughs> so he brings up the next thing he does after bitching about how he thinks there should be more differences when from his own sources, no, there shouldn't, right? That's the whole point of the CO1 gene is that it's conserved in some and it's variable in others. That's that's the whole deal. Then he brings up Crandall et al. 2012. Now, Crandall et al. 2012 is an important paper to understand because what they did is they took known expansion rate of these three invertebrates. I think it was a some kind of starfish uh, an arthropod, a, a crustacean arthropod, and a bivalve, I think. Yeah, a bivalve. So so that's those are the three that we're looking at. If you will recall, bivalves and, <laughs> and marine crustaceans and our echinoderms fall into 
marine invertebrates for who CO1 sequencing doesn't tend to work very well. This paper is from 2017, and that one that Raw Match just cited from Crandall et al. is, of course, from 2012. So we're dealing with a small disparity there, to be sure. But let's try to take it at face value, because that's what we try to do around here. <laughs> so he points out that in the Sunda shelf, like there's this disparity between, it's, it was done in the Sunda shelf, and it, there's this disparity between the evolutionary proposed rate, which he takes care to highlight this portion of the conclusion, uh, or of, of, of the paper, most rate calibrations for mitochondrial coding regions in marine species have been made from divergence dating of fossils or vicarian events older than one to two million years and are typically 0.5 to 2% per lineage per million years. Um, so, so he throws that out there and he's basically like, hey, they're using fossils to come up with the rates. Um, for marine verte invertebrates, many of whom we don't know anything about and haven't sequenced their genomes, yes, we are doing that. That is not analogous to what we see in mammals. Moreover, again, keep it in the back of your mind, CO1 barcoding is not quite as good without those workarounds. This was back in 2012 for our, our marine invertebrate pals. It, it doesn't work quite the same way. Um, then he goes, another falsification, he needs to watch Dapper Dino's video on falsification, is when you line up side by side the divergence rates for the CO1 sequences in primates, an average of 0.3% for conspecific comparisons and 5.88 for congeneric comparisons. Do you think he knows the difference between conspecific and congeneric? One is species and one is on the general level, of course, but in the genus level, but I don't know that Ramat knows that. You can see they are comparable with what's found among barcode sequence for fish and for birds. So basically he's saying that divergence rates for the CO1 for conspecific and congeneric are roughly the same across a lot of life, across, you know, three kinds of life that barcoding works really well for. Yes, that's okay. That is fair. This is a fine statement. What it isn't is a falsification of the of the conventional rate. That's not at all what it is. What he's saying here is CO1 barcoding can give us good rates for conspecific and congeneric comparisons, and that roughly for this for the um what would it be for the orders that it works for. You can you can make you can hash that out. That's the point of this paragraph. But he's making the point and then applying it to something that is like so far off left field, you have to take a freaking train to get to it. Um, but Crandall and all, they've, they've, they've done some fine work. I want to surprise, or um, not surprise, I want to highlight some of their stuff though, because this is the paper here. Now, I thought it was very interesting because while some of the rates, because Ramat is essentially saying the evolutionary rate was slower than what was actually shown via the barcoding, right? Uh, that we, what we actually find, which is what creationists need. They need fast mutation rates to get all their species and they need slow mutation rates to not be a thing because it, it indicates age. So I thought this was kind of funny because they go, following correction for a generation time effect and removal of the calibration of, of uh, T. crocea due to weak support for the two epoch model, our mean estimates of CO1 lineage substitution rates ranged from 5.2% to 6.6% per million generations for two marine invertebrate species. Per generation linear rates calibrated from the Isthmus of Panama that properly account for ancestral polymorphism are lower than this at 1.4% to 3.2%, while fossil calibrated Fossil calibrated rates for marine invertebrates are lower still, 0.5 to 1.2. Using the least squared regression, this decline in mean rate with calibration time can be described as exponential decay rates over time. Under this relationship, marine invertebrate CO1 have an instantaneous mutation rate of 5.3% per million per generation, or per million generation, sorry, uh, after lethal mutations have been removed. And this is the, whatever the kicker right here declines to long-term phylogenetic rates of 0.65% per million with a much slower rate than has been found in birds, mammals, or freshwater fish. Um, so no, Ron, that, that's not helpful. Fortunately, the paper is equally, you know, it's an honest paper, and they note too that for all of their calculations, they have really wide error bars on their conservative rates. So I don't know that you want to be hinging your entire idea of, of what barcoding is and how it works on, on this paper, especially when there's newer ones. That's just all I wanted to hi highlight from, from Crandall at all, though. I, I think that 
you know, whatever. They've done good work. Again, I, I'm this is not my typical field. But now we get to see how he misrepresents it. So now you can see when you put to the test the evolutionary assumption rate of 1% per million years that is calibrated from fossils or older Vicarian events, compared to the known demographic models of expansion, that's one thing, compared known demographic models of expansion, observed pedigree mutation rate studies, comparing mutation rates of other genes and fragments in mitochondria, and also comparing side-by-side -side differences in species supposedly separated by millions of years that still share a hygienic similarity of nucleotide sequences in the region. They all tell the same story. You get a huge difference. Only one outlier is here, the phylogenetic assumption method used, not to mention they make no testable predictions using a mutation rate. If you think people don't make testable predictions using mutation rates, you've never read a single paper all the way through that that is concerned with mutation rates. That's full stop. Like I, I used to think, hmm, well, I wonder what kind of predictions we do make for mutation rates. And then when I started actually like reading some of these papers, I realized that it's just it, it's just there. Like that's part of their methods. That's part of what's being done. Those those predictions. So this last thing here is in reference to these things right here. These comparisons, which again, don't help his case because he doesn't understand conserved sections versus highly variable sections. So we can forget about the comparing side-by-side -side differences in species supposedly separated by millions of years. Comparing mutation rates of other genes and fragments in the mitochondria, we'll talk about mitochondria rates later. Observable pedigree mutation rates, again, I told you put a pin in pedigree mutation rates, and known demographic models of expansion, which other demographic models of expansion for species that aren't just in this study corroborate evolutionary theory like that that's part of the basis of like how out of africa happened that's validation for human evolution right and that's mammals too again we we love to we love to cover cover our mammals Anyways, he, he waxes poetically more for a little while on the CO1 gene mutation rate, talking about how it's <laughs> it's a high it's an order of magnitude higher than assumed fossil record calibration rates. He's just using Crandall et al. for that. Keep that in mind. And then he brings time dependency molecular rates from Ho et al. in 2005. I don't think he knows what time dependent mutation rates are, but but we'll touch on that. This tells us that population expansion rather than divergence assumptions is superior in calculation. No. That's not at all what this tells us. This tells us that the, the population expansion was a helpful factor in determining aspects of these three marine invertebrates for whom CO1 barcoding doesn't typically work for. That's all that says. <laughs> I, like, the, he makes these weird logical leaps all the time. Even though still not even close to as accurate as pedigree studies would be, Oh man, poor Ramat. Really put a pin in this pedigree studies are important thing. Okay, right? As there are still evolutionary assumptions going into population expansion models as well. For example, one study demonstrated the method of a marine population. Is this just Crandall et al. again? No, no, no. This is Barbara et al. in 2006. Crandall cites this though, if memory serves. Yeah. So he's he's literally using this demographic expansion as better than than like um divergence points for marine invertebrates pretty much exclusively. Which is the one that you, oh god, I, I can't. Because of these discrepancies, evolutionists use a few co different concepts to assume CO1 differences in species. For worms, another invertebrate, they used simulations because it's an invertebrate. For others, they use phylogeny, divergent time, or bootstrapping. Imagine talking shit about bootstrapping when you don't know what evolution is. Unfortunately, all of them have evolutionary assumptions built in. Like what, Ramat? For an accurate measure of time, we should use what we observe, not speculate, put a pin in that, uh, based on deep time as our only option, blah, 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 blah. He talks about deloop de mutation rates. We'll cover that later. He can wait, what does he say? Are evolutionists making any future testable predictions on CO1 mutation rates or the entire mtDNA mutation rates? Or how about the D loop mutation rates? Nope. Odd that it's just YEC making predictions and yet they continue to complain. Yet and yet the critics continue playing cut to complain, yet make no predictions of their own. Peculiar. Hmm. Curious. Like, you know, again, let me hold on. Let me see what the chat is up to over here. Okay, chat is hanging out. Um, yeah, you guys, please do let me know if you have read, if you, like, agree with the sentiment that no predictions are made by about mutation rates. Please let me know your thoughts.
I think that that's um that that's funny. So here's the kicker. This is this is what I care about because this is Raw Matt's barcoding conclusion right here. And I've taken what you can see here and put it over here um, in our PowerPoint presentation. So what do we got? What's going on here? Raw Matt opts for inclusive kinds. This is from him. So what now? So what now are these borders? Erica loves numbers. So let's give her some. When we look at the entire Canis genus, wolf, jackal, we find a threshold of 123 nucleotides uniting them all into one large Canis kind. None fall outside that. We can also do the same with Felidae, and notice that when we look at different feline species in the Barcode of Life database, including domesticated cats, a threshold of 118 nucleotides is uniting them all into one big related cat kind. With a hyena kind, 13 nucleotide differences unite them all. Yet between the hyena, wolf, fox, cats, hyena have many nucleotide differences that separate them from the others. They are over 285 nucleotide differences from the mountain cats, over 280 nucleotide differences from the wolf, and 212 for the mongoose. So, alarm bells should be going off because what's happening here is Raw Matt appears to be taking the family level, looking at it, saying, yeah, those things kind of look okay. I guess I'll make the threshold there. And then seeing how many differences there are and then saying that those are that's the threshold. Like this, this is some real circular reasoning going on here. But the good news is all of these thresholds except for the hyena kind, both of these thresholds, the 123 and the 118, more than encompass the 60 nucleotide differences that separate humans and chimps. Boy, I boy, I sure hope Ron Matt um, is just as consistent there, don't you? And of course, he's got this 13 nucleotide differences for hyenas, but that's going to create problems because that's like humans and Denisovans fall outside that range. So there's no way he's going to do that. So what do we get? <laughs> Raw Matt gives this hot brainlet take where he says, so what's the line? Can we see it like a single floodline layer, which you also can't see? No, it's different for each kind because it's dependent on their specific mutation rate per generation. If I must put a number on the Hominidae family, then for humans, it's 21, as no part of mankind goes above 20 differences, and even the most inbred mutated of them all, Neanderthal and Denisovans, and no primate, order primate, and then he puts in parentheses grade ape, which is the family level, goes below 22. And I read this and like I astrally projected into the sun because I was like, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. Uh, so there are some obvious problems. First of all, threshold is something Raw Matt made up. He gives no definition, but he just kind of suggests that whatever number he decides seems to be the, the, the boundary. Uh, that's that's the boundary. And he decides he does so with no justification. Then he genuinely arbitrarily decides that these nucleotide differences that mark the family level are the kind barriers at insane numbers in the hundreds. And then turns around and decides that 60 differences is oh, that's just too much that separate humans from chips from the rest of the hominids. Most ira or most um uh, most disturbing most disturbingly, given that. If from Matt, Raw Matt's own source right here, orangutans are the outgroup when we're barcoding these guys. Orangutans are more of an outgroup than humans are by a significant degree. So this is from Raw Matt's own sources. Orangutans, they're the outgroup, not humans, when we're comparing the barcodes of all of these guys. But Raw Matt just goes, nah, all the apes are the same kind except for humans. Um, and and when, when trying to come up with the criteria, he decides that it's 20 differences and under for humans and 21 differences and over is for apes, which doesn't make any sense as a methodology anyways. But let's continue to appreciate the problem because what he seems to be saying is that mutation rates define the threshold, right? That seems to be the vibe that I'm getting. He's saying mutation rates are different depending on the kind. And so we can use those mutation rates to, to determine a threshold, right? 
He doesn't give us any kind of methodology to tell us how we use the mutation rates to find the threshold. He doesn't tell us what those error bars look like depending on the species. What, what is the minimum and maximum range of mutation rates you can have to fall within a species? He doesn't do any of that because I don't think he's capable of it. But let's, let's talk about mutation rates because I've got some recent papers I think Raw Matt needs to know about. Um, and, and I think that they would be fun for you guys to see as well. So remember how he really, really likes pedigrees? Direct estimation of mutations in great apes reconciles phylogenetic dating. So pedigree rates using trios validates the fossil record and the hominin slowdown hypothesis. This paper is like the opposite. I realize I just went like six octaves up and like shattered. I'm sure some of you are experiencing glass shattering in your <laughs> in your homes. But this paper is like a huge linchpin yanked from, from Raw Matt's like crumbling tower that like a baby built with paper mache. Um, the human mutation rate per generation um, estimated from trio sequencing has revealed an almost linear relationship with the age of the father and the mother. So basically they did these trios, they did the same thing with, um, with gorillas and with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. I, I don't know if they did bonobos, I think they just did chimps. And they were like, yeah, boy, it really was hard when we were using like consistent classic phylogenetic rates without taking into account um, the paternal bias is that this is what they go into, how mom versus dad contributes in, in mutations. Um, and that's why science is cool because it can change once you learn new things. This is something that, boy, I see a lot of creationists shitting their pants over. They don't like that one bit. Um, but the paper's quite nice and it goes through the human mutation rate obtained through pedigree, uh, which is what Jensen did. Unfortunately, this does indeed uh, not, not corroborate Jensen's work. Oh, they did O-rings as well. Um, so observed rates, right? And we see this, this nicest, nicest range. Of course, the mutation rate for orangs does indeed fall a bit outside the norm. These are the expected rates versus the observed rates. And the observed rates taken in pedigree which I, I want to be very clear about something. When you're looking at the pedigree mutation rate, this is something you need to know when you're dealing with um, the kinds of creationists, huh, kinds, uh, that, that we're looking at here. The pedigree mutation rate is inherently going to be faster than the phylogenetic rate, which is why this paper takes into account the difference when they're explaining the equations that they've used, because there's a way to mathematically take the, phylo or the, the pedigree rate and extrapolate that into a pedigree rate or into a, a phylogenetic rate. Pedigree into phylogenetic, right? Uh, inherently, because of all the filtering mechanisms that goes on with mutation and selection, the phylogenetic rate is going to be slower. So these guys don't take the pedigree rate and say, this is the rate we're using. They take the pedigree rate and say, this is the pedigree rate. And then this is the phylogenetic rate. That's the good science behind it. Um, so yes, Ramat, pedigree rates are very important. All you want to do is use pedigree rates for sure. They're the only ones direct observation. That's the key. Um, and then when we do that thing that he wants us to do, it validates human evolution and the divergence times that we see for the hominin fossil record. Awesome. Then we take a look at this lovely paper right here, the evolution of mutation rates across primates. This is a very, very good one. Uh, also covers the hominin slowdown hypothesis and tells us why it's such a valid means of, of uh, explaining the human mutation rate, which is uh, in pedigree form, much faster than what we see in chimps. But once you take into account the phylogenetics, there's like a less than 2% difference between the two, which is really important to, to consider. Um, the phylogenetic rate, again, is something that's mathematic in nature. But this is something that's nice. I like this very much. Um, because the mutation rate that Ramat, Ramat wants to use mutation rate as a threshold and humans down here, this is mean age of reproduction. We don't really care about the x-axis as much, but the reported pedigree rate on yearly mutations is here on the y. And um, we've got a real nice cluster here of, um, of y-axis for all of the hominoids. And in fact, all of them are kind of more close to one another. I mean, we're eyeballing it. I, I would need to see the exact numbers, but they're certainly very similar to what we see in the separation between rhesus macaques and baboons, who are both ground monkeys that are almost like they're very similar genetically. I'm sure Ramat would not consider them to be different kinds, to be sure. Um, 
But I, I find this very funny. They also showed in this one that the slowdown mutation rate hasn't just happened in humans. They, they propose that we're seeing this as well in lemurs and in, in some members of, of uh, lemurs, strepsorines. So, um, or specifically lemur strepsorines, which is really, really cool. Um, both of these papers BTFO what we've seen from raw mat so far, but it gets even more delicious um, because another recent paper from 2020, very recently, a comparison of humans and baboons suggests germline mutation rates don't track cell divisions, um, shows us that the human mutation rate, which is quite slow, is very similar to the baboon mutation rate, which is also quite slow um, or considered to be quite slow, um, which is funny to me. I don't know. I think that that's enjoyable. Um, so let's, let's hop, let's hop back over to, to our PowerPoint and, and continue along with this mess. Additionally, this is something else that I, that I wanted to, to kind of suggest to you. So the CO1 gene is responsible for aspects of cellular respiration. So what can this tell us about the human relationship to other apes? The interesting thing is it tells us quite a bit because if Romat wants to say, uh-oh, mutation rates don't work as my threshold, as we've just seen, he wants to go, mm, maybe it's a difference in the gene. Maybe it's specifically to do with the gene, the CO1 gene, and, and we can use that as the threshold. I don't think he knows what that means, but I'm just thinking that's going to be the next logical step for him. And I thought that this was interesting anyway, so I thought I would go ahead and share it with you. So barcoding of animal life cytochrome C, C oxidase um, subunit 1, divergence among closely related species. This is really interesting uh, for no other reason other than that it tells us that um, the, uh, let's see, where is it? Where I'm trying to find it. Boop, boop, boop. Come on, where are you? And hold on. Let's see. Yeah. So I thought this was kind of interesting here. For example, despite the close genetic similarity of their nuclear genomes, orangutan mitochondria experience a total collapse in respiratory capacity when placed in human cell backgrounds. Um, that would be expected, right? And the evolutionary prediction at this point would be, since orangutans are the of all of the hominids, the least related to us, right? Chimps and gorillas should fare better. And boy, did they. When they were placed into the human environment, the human cell background, their, their mitochondria, they only experienced a 20% reduction in their oxidative capability uh, or ca uh, capacity in a, a human cytogenic setting, uh, which is interesting because when they went on to try this with copepods, which are these charming little fellows right here, copepods, they found that copepod regional variants experienced more difficulty with this transplantation than uh, this xenotransplantation than, than, the, than the hominids did, um, which I, I thought was funny and interesting as well. Um, and then I have these up here because these are those papers, the xeno uh, mitochondrial hybrids. Or, I don't know, thought that was neat. So let us, let us round this up because Ronat's criteria here of using barcoding is like a deck of cards. Each suit is a kind, right? And in the case of the hearts, to be a member of the heart kind, you must have a heart symbol. Think of the heart kind like the cat kind here. Uh, having a heart symbol would mean you're within that 100 and base pair different, uh, 118 base pair differences. But not all kinds experience a standardized criteria. That's what we saw. That was part two of that, seeing these wild ranges for some and then itty bitty ranges to keep humans from being hominids. In the case of the spades, to be a member of the spade kind, you have to have a spade symbol. Unless you're also an ace, if you're a spade and an ace, then you can you belong to the spade ace kind. Um, consider the spade kind as analogous to the hominid kind and the spade ace kind to be analogous to the human kind. Having a spade symbol is being above 22 differences uh, and then having a spade symbol with an ace is be being below. So the result is this, the left is the cat kind and the right is the human kind plus the hominid kind. There is no rhyme or reason to this at all. It is entirely arbitrary. Why in the cat kind would being a heart and an ace also separate you? Why does any, what's going on here? This is like crazy town job is, is what we're looking at here. But it's even worse because it's inconsistent. So being an ace and being a spade will land humans out. 
But being even more different than that, being a king, I realize the analogy doesn't track fully here, but being king and being a spade, like orangutans who are more different from the rest of these than our humans are, you stay in. There's zero consistency with this. This is the ultimate failure of trying to understand a concept. Mutation rates are invoked as justification for this abominable inconsistency, of course, but as we just saw, mutation rates don't work and end up lumping all sorts of different organisms together where perhaps they shouldn't be. Um, and in this example, mutation rates might be similar to the instructions for printing the car. They're wholly irrelevant to how similar they are currently, but they are informative to explaining why they are the way that they are. So in summary, CO1 DNA barcoding cannot delineate kinds. Ramat's usage of DNA barcoding is inconsistent and lacks any kind of empirical methodology. What does he mean when he says threshold and why? How empirically does he justify placing the jackals and the foxes and the canid kind with these 93 differences, but then not humans and chimps with 60? Um, it's arbitrary is my point. Mutation rates empirically don't work as a threshold, not that he had that methodology anyways, <laughs> but humans map with the hominids. Uh, whether we use pedigree or phylogenetic work, as we just saw from the most recent literature, Ramat's been corrected on this already. To his credit, he has added new incorrect things. So Ramat, <laughs> in his actual coverage, continues to cry and moan about all of this. He shows us the cutoff line and, and basically argues that the cutoff line is different because of Shared sequences is what we look for to group things together. You're a big hypocrite, Ramat. You don't understand what shared sequences are, which is insane to me because both of those words are very simple. As we look for the highest nucleotide differences with the highest generation time within the family, this is the oldest ancestor within that kind. So now, what would see suggesting now generation time is at play within the family? Well, that's going to be very problematic for many of the long-lived versus very short-lived cat kinds who orders of magnitude when compared to humans and chimps. Um, <clears throat> or lest we even cross into the arthropods with that, who are even more eh, problematic. <laughs> then as mutation rates accumulate over time, we're able to draw a line on what separates the different kinds from one another using the CO1 gene because of its fast rate of mutation. This is why there's also no not a universal nucleotide number to use to draw a line because each species has its own generation time, which influences the rate of change over time. For example, how about the man, mankind versus ape kind regarding mutation buildup? We'll see for yourself. The CO1 gene has been between 0.001 to two nucleotide differences among the similarity growing up to 10 at the max. Um, but again, he's not providing us any kind of reasoning for why 20 is the cutoff point. It's arbitrary. It's 100% it's arbitrary. There is no reason to draw that line there. Mutation rates won't do it, and neither will generation time. Yet the closest primate to the human is the chimp with over 60 nucleotide differences on average. This is not a small gap, you freaking hypocrite. For a species, and like humans and apes with long generation times, it's a very big gap, actually. Look at dogs and cats, for example. And then he just doesn't say anything about dogs and cats <laughs> like <laughs> he just doesn't talk about them since the genetic diversity was reset at this bottleneck and mutation rates are the same between primates and man an order in a freaking species then why such a huge discrepancy um again the pedigree studies that raw mat pl places as the highest form of studying mutation rates support the hominin slowdown hypothesis they, they map and corroborate phylogenetic dating. You have to account for this, Ramad. Why does the pedigree thing, the pedigree method that you hold so, up so high on a pedestal, corroborate evolution? Just like every other aspect that you've tried, every other um, uh, delineation that you've tried to use for this. Um, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And it, boy, howdy, has it been a waste of my time. You see why they need mutation rates to be slow? No, we've shown them to be slow by the papers that I just presented. And he cries and moans about it. There's no way around this. The global flood was true and our evidence is in our genetics. The evidence is in our genetics, whether we like it or not. Entire thing comes down to mutation rates. Hold on. All around me are familiar faces. That's, that's, you don't want to say it all comes down to mutation rates, Ramat. That doesn't help you, my boy. Oh, this is another thing that's really funny. He talks about how chimps have, like, he talks about their age of sexual maturity, um, which is just completely irrelevant outside of generation times, I suppose. 
but generation times vary wildly within humans. Um, and they also vary quite a bit during, uh, to, to the Panins and the Gorillans and, um, and Homo too. So he, he basically says all of that stuff. I, I realize I've been harping on this for a while now. But then he says, feel free to skip this because I just wanted to reiterate why the 200,000 bottleneck they invoke was more tossed into the study. If you look really deep at the study, I don't think raw mats ever looked really deep at anything. You may notice that they use nuclear genomic analysis to acquire slight DNA changes, meaning they did not focus on determining age. Yes. I know. Again, they assumed that using past phylogenetic studies, not TRIO, that's pedigree that he's referring to there, paleontology, anthropology, history, and linguistics. Under the section they call tentative time scale, you find Rebecca Can et al. tells you that she obtained the time scale in figure three by divergence of clusters specific to New Guinea, Australia, and the New World. Look for yourself at the assumptions made into the barcode study. Yeah, so so he doesn't like that, like half of it also, half of the paper that he's invoking also just really disagrees with them. So he has to come up with some reason as to why, nah, I don't like this one. When again, you want to use the pedigrates. Oh no, oh no, uh oh, stinky. <laughs> the, the, you just really don't want to play this game today, Ron Matt. Also tells me how up to date he is on his literature because that paper was from two years ago. So yeah, he he basically complains about this bottleneck thing. He thinks there's ad hoc like arguments, which is the ultimate irony if you've been paying attention to this video. I hope that answers to satisfaction where to draw the line because it is clear enough for them to see in the study and anyone who does barcoding to recognize even the amateurs. Let's see if let's see if rational mind is in the side chat. Hey, rational mind, if you're there, please do tell us. Is this obvious to the amateurs? Is the situation uh, obvious? Hello, Kyle Saltzman. Welcome. We also have the real Otangelo. Will the real Otangelo please stand up? Mikael Koning, the YEC dictionary follows Humpty Dumpty rules for words. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Nestle 20. Notice how the branch links of humans in the mitochondrial DNA tree DNA are all short compared to the others, low genetic diversity, and how within chimps the branches are longer. Yeah, I do notice that. Let's see here. What else do we got going on? Anyone else hanging in? The yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Rational Mind. <laughs> oh, man. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, Rational Mind, if you're listening, I thought it would be really funny to take a moment to and like compare, because I, I, I didn't have the nucleotide differences for orangutans. I just had that diagram. So I would love to see at some point the, the barcode, like base pair differences, right, between all of the apes, the, the hominids and orangs. I, I think that would be really interesting and to see how different the two subspecies of orangs are. Brian Stevens, oh wow, all the big words. I'm truly impressed. Too bad there is no reasoning behind them. Yeah, too bad. Boy, isn't that a tragedy? Yeah, then he gives us all these beautiful links. Erica also failed in a debate with SFT to explain why the Y chromosome between chimpanzees and humans is so dissimilar. I've already talked this to death in my video of, hey, creationists, you're still apes, here's why. The reason why, interestingly enough, the Y chromosome is so divergent in chimpanzees has in part due to their sexual selection, but also they're the outgroup. They've, they've actually experienced truncation of their Y chromosome. They're the outgroup of all of the hominids. They're the one with the unique Y chromosome. And they display an incredible range of diversity of their Y chromosome, like more so than the other hominid, the other African hominids. So gorillas and humans. That's interesting because if Ramat wants to use the, um, the, sort of uniqueness of the Y chromosome to delineate kinds, well, then you're going to get a different kind for even some subspecies of chimpanzees. So nope, that doesn't work. And I did cover that. And no, none of them actually responded to my, my response, I guess. Like this is that same thing I was telling you yesterday. They say A, and then I say, A can't be the case because of B. And B is just like some random conventional science fact, right? Supported by dozens and dozens of papers in the literature. And then they go, huh, but have you considered A? And then I'm like, what about B? You didn't cover B. You didn't tell me why B isn't a good critique. That's the problem with the Y chromosome. They haven't covered my critique of it. They just keep repeating the same premise. Erica took numerous months to provide a rebuttal to the data that strongly indicates independent origins. Her answer was an epic fail, which we very quickly responded to in the video response. No, you didn't. You, you really didn't. The reason it took me so long was because, unfortunately, 
I'm a master student trying to write a thesis. And during this time period, I was having to change my thesis from one behavioral project to a morphology based project. That was a desk project that I didn't collect many of my own data for. I also have a job and a life. And I was moving from the UK to the United States. So I didn't exactly have the time to sit down and, and do a full response video to someone who, um, does so little work and cares so little about the discussion, but no, it was, <laughs> I have not, exp I have not actually gotten very many answers at all to the questions that I posed, as you can see here. Um, this video, see above, so thoroughly dismantled Erica's epic fail of response to the Y chromosome data that helps confirm independent origin. She has nothing left in terms of the case for hominid ancestry. The data she asked for pertaining to a genetic barrier between humans and apes has been answered over and over again with no rebuttals and no real challenges. Like, this is just not true. You know, like, this is just something that is blatantly dishonest to anyone who has eyes and has experienced any of their content um, in passing, even. <laughs> I, I, I honestly can't. My SF, my SFT, newest book, oh, okay, this is SFT here. SFT. I that's so, this is so embarrassing that you even let your name be on this document. Newest book, Special Creation, provides an overwhelming case for independent origins. This book also refutes the best and most common objections made by critics. I'm not buying another one of their books. I genuinely don't give two shits if your answer to me is in that book. If it's not in an easily accessible video, I'm not giving you my money. I'm just not doing it. And here's the reason. Because if you actually had a response to it, you wouldn't self-publish on Amazon standing you would publish in a peer-reviewed journal and let people who have degrees in this subject critique your work. But then Raw Matt did that, didn't he? The famous PLOS biology incident, the reason why everyone on YouTube who knows him considers him an academic fraud. Well, have they accepted that yet, Raw Matt? Have they accepted that journal or that, um, that study of yours, the antediluvian patriarch one? Hmm, didn't think so. If we had a dollar for every argument Erica ignored and demonstrates that demonstrates independent origins, we'd all be millionaires. <laughs> we'd all have the big money, baby. <laughs> like, I just can't like the, the logic of this. This is I, I think Walker, actually, my buddy Walker demonstrated this the best. He created the best analogy there. We have the arguments that overturn the foundational theory of biology but they just go to another school. Like, <laughs> I've never heard one from them that I haven't addressed. They, they don't like the addressing, though. They, they don't like that because they don't cover my actual rebuttals. They don't, I don't think, I can count on one hand the number of times that I've seen Standing for Truth actually go through a paper um, on his channel. They, they don't do that. They, they definitely don't go through it in depth. The times that they do, they like pull it up, eh, look at the abstract. Maybe they pick a couple of things from the conclusion that they like. Um, but on, on this channel, because I've, value you guys as time when we're going to look at a paper um that that like we're essentially trying to digest its entire contents we do go through the entire paper if if we've got the time if it if it matters if it's relevant um but oh, what do i know mm. <clears throat> let, let me check in let me check in with chat real quick because we're about to move on to the next question that's been answered <laughs> they wouldn't be rich, they'd be piss poor. Yeah, I do agree. Yeah, no, I'm not wasting my money. From Rich Estrada, love you, Erica. Thank you so much for your $2 donation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this this all, this stuff is all really funny. Please, do, do feel free. Is it possible to check SFT sales numbers? There's no way he'd let that be possible. If it's possible to make, he would, are you kidding me? If SFT had great sales numbers for those books, you don't think he'd be plastering them over every community post in every single video he has? No, no way. Let's see, you got to given what YouTube viewers don't count as a lie. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, mm, mm. As Standing for Truth has said multiple times, please, since the, since the viewers are the most important in deciding uh, who is right in debating just a fact of biology? Feel free to let Standing for Truth know if you've consumed both of our content, what you think, um, who you think is right. <laughs> Ex so my second question was, explain why Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis, as well as the associated Homo rudolfensis and Homo gautengensis, which I didn't include here, um, uh, are not valid organisms. 
already covered this ad nauseum. Let's do something fun here. Debunking the fossil record. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. Okay, here it is. Yeah. I have I've actually watched all of these. I just haven't watched them all on the uh all on the same all at the same time. <laughs> 48 views. 48 truthers active in the chat. All right. I want to do an experiment here. I want to see when these are dated for. Like when these uh were released in comparison to my over 6 hours of coverage for <laughs> for Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. Um and Australopithecus sediba, which, of course, he doesn't actually talk about. Okay, two months ago, two months ago, approximately. We might have to, we might have to do a little bit more in depth uh, on that. Do you, does your job involve hugging primates? I wish. I mean, I hug humans, so I do hug primates technically. Wait, did I get rid of the... Oh, no, it's over here. It's over here. Wait, is it? No, it's over here. Okay, so... Let's see if we can't find the dates. Last updated October 10th, 2020. So that would have been when it was added. Uh-oh. October 28th, 2020. So I hope that it's clear to you here what has gone on. I created over six hours of content discussing Homo habilis and Australopithecus sediba, the earlier video of which was eight days after the last time that it was added to this playlist. So Ramat is saying that he's answered my questions ad nauseum on this right here, on this question, by referring to videos that came out before I ever discussed it in depth. So, and I covered both a couple of those videos in these two videos. The questions that he's highlighting were in this video right here, which was also after any of these videos from this playlist were made. Uh, what is it that the kiddos say? Raw Matt's acting like a big simp right now, a big simp for bad science. Yeah, so. Oh, right. We're keeping track. Okay, so did Raw Matt actually answer the first question? He attempted to. Okay, he attempted to, and he did attempt to give new reasoning. So I will give them credit for trying to answer this question. Check. You guys can have full credit um, for that. Even though I just showed you why it's incorrect here, so naturally it's no longer answered. You're going to have to answer it again with new reasoning. But it was answered to Raw Matt's credit. Not in any of the videos, but here. Did they answer the question that I presented in the video that was responded to with the playlist that came out before the video? Why Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis are not valid organisms? No, this question has not been answered. The timeline alone creates a problem. So no, not answered. Did they present valid reasoning to propose Homo floresiensis as just pathologic slash degraded Homo sapiens or Homo erectus, understanding the consensus that they are bucking? This is an interesting one. Um, this video here that was not responded to, big surprise. I don't know that I would be throwing around not responding to things, accusations, my friend Ramat. Um, this video here, if you'll remember the stipulate, this is from uh, Dinosaurs by Design, actually, this, this picture right here, a book I stole from the library as a youngster. Um, yeah, their entire argument in this video, the reason I didn't cover it from September 20, 29th, uh, 2020, the reason I didn't cover it directly is because it's the same arguments. The, the most up-to-date literature on Homo floresiensis delineates this organism as having likely come from the likes of Homo habilis or maybe even an Australopithecine. That's what the literature says. The last person that said it came from Homo erectus was from 2009. And in my questions video, which this did not come after, right? And neither did this one. Which is oh this is just a this is just a, a playlist so this is the only video yeah so so in my questioning right here I said to Ramat I said like or Ramat saying for truth I was like you have to answer this question you have to understand the, the literature that you're debunking explain why post two thousand nine everyone's assessment is wrong you this is that same thing again A is true A is not true because of B and then A is true is repeated again this is the only kind of argument that we see from these people. That's it. 
That's it. That's all we get. So this is yet again another question that has not been answered because you have not covered the literature that I have presented to you. You simply say, I don't like that literature. And I think Standing's actual statement was, you can find a point of view that can prove anything. That's not how any of this works, literature-wise, specifically, uh, or rather particularly, in a field as small as paleoanthropology. Homo floresiensis is also not pathologic. You haven't covered that or the support that it came from an Australopithecine, uh, or descended rather from an Australopithecine population or um, an early habilis population, Homo habilis population. Um, also, why does your question have an argument ad populum fallacy in it? Because you haven't addressed the literature. That, that's the point. There are multiple different pieces of the literature that disagree with your assessment, and you haven't touched them. That is that is why I'm bringing it up. Um, and then, yeah, then he shows a fucking live science thing right here. This, this live science, oh my god, like, how, okay, okay, let's find out from when this, from when this live science article came out, okay? Let's find out when this came out. Um, the surprising discovery of bones heralded as a new, the surprising heralding of bones posited as a new, was that it? Was it posited? Y'all roast me in the chat if it's not posited. Heralded as a new, damn it. Heralded as a new. Heralded as a new, let's see if that brings anything up. We'll go with live science. Mm -mm -mm. My, my inkling is that this is a freaking ancient ass article, but we'll find out. Maybe I have to put more in there. As a new hobbit-like human species. Let's try that. As a new hobbit-like species. Okay, let's see. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. Those are both newer life science articles. That's still new. Too new. Okay, let's see. Nope, it's all too new. Does anyone in the chat want to find this for me and, and let me know how old this is? Because it's not even, you can't even find it online. Awesome. I love that. Uh, oh, anyways, by the way, something that is funny is that a newer live science article, a find of bones that tells new tales here. Let's see. I don't know, live science. We want a live science article. We need one. I don't need it. I don't need it. I need it. Okay, here we go. Most interesting articles and mysteries. Let's just go with live science. Homo. Floresiensis. Who is Homo Floresiensis? From 2016. We'll just go down to the conclusion. Let's see. Was it a separate species? Come on, me to the money. The findings suggested Homo erectus may be an ancestor. Most recently, a research team used a different pathological argument. However, in a PNAS response to the paper, they showed that it wasn't pathologic. And in a study published in the Royal Society B, yep, Homo, okay. What's more interesting, the analysis suggests the hobbit is a descendant of pre-Homo erectus small-bodied hominin that migrated out of Africa into Southeast Asia. This implies that Homo erectus may not have been the first hominin to migrate out of Africa, uh, and then also from up here, it's not uh, pathologic. So you're, you're using an out you're, you're using an outdated live science article. That's pathetic. God, what a freaking waste of my time. Oh, and a waste of yours by proxy. I'm so sorry. Uh, this was, I was going to show a clip from Rational Minds video on Jackson's channel at the end. Okay, May 18th. Yeah, 2006. Awesome. Very nice. Very cool. 10 years later. You can't even use the article from 10 years later. I long for the day where I stop getting frustrated at Gracious and let the next generation deal with them. Yes, yeah, same Kyle Saltzman. Very same indeed. Um, absolutely no excuse for this kind of uh, nonsense. Just no excuse. It, you have to find the ugly German truths had to dig for that. It, like, you, oh God, so dishonest. Okay, so, okay, so homo answer, no. So we have an answer of one out of three. 
Explain why you disregard the papers for studies done on the Laetuli footprints being made by Australopithecus afarensis. Hint, they look human is not an answer. Explain why the weight, explain the weight bearing uh, uh, disparity and the semen divergent toe. So he shows the Laetuli footprints were not, were not known to be so old. He shows a freaking picture of that. And the source is from 1990. Really good stuff, Ramat. Really good stuff. Then they show us this. This is hilarious to me. You want to, I'll show you why it's hilarious in a moment. <laughs> because anyone with more than half a brain would conclude this. The very person sitting on a bench who is a specialist recognized them as human footprints. No, they didn't. When someone, this, so back in the day, originally, the big question was, did bipedality come first or did big brains come first? Well, they totally footprints helped settle this in human evolution because we know that an Australopithecine made these footprints. I have presented the paper that I'm going to show you guys in a moment concerning the biomechanics behind the Laetoli footprints to the brain trust probably three times, and I have never seen them actually cover anything in the paper, nothing from the methodology, nothing about their results, nothing about the discussion, nothing in the conclusion. They won't touch it with a 60-foot pole because it's damning. That's that's the reason. They, they won't touch it. And Ramat, every freaking time this happens, he goes, well, did you eyeball it? You dumb bitch. Are you serious? I'm sorry. That was really mean. But but th that's what he's acting like. This th It's so insulting. Every time he does this, he's got to say something along the lines of, you know, why didn't you just look at it? Just compare them side by side. You know, like, like the people who spend decades in this, of uh, blood, sweat, and tears publishing on this don't understand how to take empirical measurements and, and whether something that looks like a thing is indeed that thing. That This logic is insane to me, and it's insulting. So, sorry, Ramat, I got a little angry there. I got a little carried away. I don't think I've ever called anyone a dumb bitch on this channel before, but you are acting like one here. Um, I, 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 that's insane. Think about this logic. Is Australopithecus afarensis tall? The footprint was over 10 inches long. He's talking about the Ketamendu man. Uh, Kamenudu man, sorry, um, which is a separate line of tracks associated with the Laetoli footprints. And yes, Lucy was not tall, but Australopithecus afarensis is a highly sexually dimorphic species. It's been tracked along the lines of what we see in gorillas, wherein males can be twice the size of females. So yes, and I've explained this to them before already. I've already done this. I've provided the papers in the description. I've gone through the papers. This is a, I don't even have to look at the rest of it. We are going to look at it, but no, this question has not been answered. Not in the slightest. This is the bare minimum. It's embarrassing. It's pathetic. And boy, howdy, is it a waste of everyone's time. So let's, let's continue with this one. Basic logic answers the question as well. Yeah, dude, you think the earth is round? I go outside my house, I see the flat of the horizon. It's basic logic. It looks flat, so the Earth is flat. Measurements? No, I don't take those. Hey, that's the kind of logic here. Now, here's a couple of things. I'm going to cover this picture here, which is the, the, the epitome of the just eyeball it thing. Then he brings up the Tracheos footprints, which I made a whole damn video on that he apparently didn't watch, wherein Jeff Meldrum and um, the, the Tracheos footprints were by Gearlinsk et al., but uh, Jeff Meldrum and Esteban Sarmiento, one of which is a hominid locomotion specialist and specialist on uh, foot morphology, and the other, Sarmiento, who specializes in extant primate morphology and uh, locomotion. Both of them commented and BTFO'd the idea that these are anything close to hominid footprints, okay? Hominid footprints, even. And part of the reason is because they lack, <clears throat> excuse me, any kind of consistency. Some of the footprints are that big, some are this big. It, the, none of their all mixed together in a large group. This is something that is almost definitively not going to be um, a trackway for a hominin. Now, another reason that this is interesting is because Gierlinski, speci sorry, specializes in Mesozoic dinosaur trackways traditionally. So naturally, eh, I just spilled water out of rage. Naturally, when you're working outside of your field, it's good practice to consult someone who's within it. Um, Gierlinski, to my knowledge, I don't know if he did or didn't, but the comments that came out afterwards are the standing opinion on the Trachea's prints. 
Again, made a whole video on that. Was any of that information touched? No, none of it was, of course not. Then he goes, it, the undeniable coexistence of humans and Australopithecines, including Artie, is well documented. No, not even close to correct. The reason that this is proposed is, is like degrees of separation. Raw Matt thinks the Laetoli footprints were created by humans. And he thinks the Trachios prints are hominid prints. Thus, he thinks they're made by humans too. So he uses that unsupported, unempirical, and unaccepted, it's not even a hypothesis because it's it's been um, you, it not falsified or anything like that, but there, there's no support for it. But he uses that general idea to make the leap that humans and Artipithecus ramidus from five, four to five million years ago lived at the same time. And then he calls it the undeniable coexistence of humans and Australopithecines. That's despicably false. And is such an insult to anyone who gives any little manner of shit about how science works. Um, then he uses this Bernard Wood, uh, the claim that Artie was a facultative terrestrial biped living in the trees and also walked up right on the ground is, via, or is um, uh, vitiated. You know, vitiated because it based on highly speculative informator uh, inferences of the presence of lower lumbar lordosis on the relatively few features of the pelvis and foot. Um, Bernard Wood has thoughts on Artipithecus ramidus, and Artipithecus ramidus is not thought by conventional science to have walked in the same way that humans did. Why he's bringing up Artipithecus ramidus, who is definitively a biped based off of its skull morphology and pelvis, is irrelevant to the Laetoli footprints, but we'll cover that too in a minute. Lumbar lordase dosis is when the, he talks about freaking circus monkeys and um, how that phenotypic plasticity works. He quotes Tim White with no source of where that came from. So I'm not even going to give it the time of day. Tim White does not think that Artipithecus ramidus is, an a is fully ape and non-transitional, nor does he think that Australopithecus afarensis is non-transitional. He doesn't think either of those things. And you, you can read his books, you can read his papers. So this is, a, a, I mean... If someone were like, show me an example of a quote mine, this is just what I would show them. So there you go. The weight and the big toe are indicative of humans. I don't think Ramat knows uh, like what the science word is for big toe. So I don't think he has any authority to throw a statement out like this without any coverage. Um, or without any sourcing. This is actually well investigated in the Max Planck Institute. And they confirmed that whatever made the footprints looks just like you and me with a slight difference in the way we moved. Wrong. Absolutely incorrect. And we're going to talk about why that's incorrect too. This is this would be, I would hazard a guess to say, even more academic fraud from Ramat because he's just, well, I don't know that it'd be, he's just grossly misrepresenting the paper. We wouldn't necessarily say the tracks looked ape-like, he says. If you saw the maker of the Laetoli footprints walking alongside a modern human, you might not notice any dramatic differences. Um, but with careful observation, you probably pick up the distinctions in the way they moved. So you're talking about the locomotion of these animals, because Australopithecus afarensis was back, uh, uh, um, a biped, almost a fac facultative biped. I think I said facultative earlier too. Facultative um, is what I meant. So let's talk about this for a minute. This is my human evolution slide. First, let's talk about Artipithecus ramidus. These guys never want to talk about the fossils um, with me, and they never want to talk about the genetics with Dan. They only want to talk about the opposite of what the person they're um, speaking to specialty is. So here's some really nice scans of Artipithecus ramidus's pelvis. This is ramidus here. This is pan troglodytes, so a modern chimp. This is Australopithecus afarensis, and this is a modern human. Look at the blades of the pelvis. Look at the angle of it. Look at the acetabulum, the nature of the acetabulum, how, how it opens, right, with all of these guys. This right here, a five-year-old could tell the difference and pick the odd man out. It's going to be pan troglodytes every time. The, that angle of the blade, it's it's a dead ringer. Um, but more, over, more than that, it's the nature of the skull, too. Um, Artipithecus ramidus has a, a foramen magnum sitting at the base of the skull, uh, which, again, as I've explained to Raw Matt many, many times before, the angle of the foramen magnum along with the position can very accurately tell us whether an organism, imagine this is a spinal cord, held its head like this or on top like this. The second, of course, necessitating bipedality. So Artipithecus ramidus was a biped, yes. 
Um, did it walk like humans? No, no one is suggesting that. Um, and then here's something that I really like too when comparing the um, the radius and the tibula. Tibula. I've been listening to Rom, or I've been listening to um, to uh, <laughs> Nephilim free too much. The tibia, my mistake. You guys roast me in the chat because I deserve it for for saying that. Mm. Anyways, yes, uh, this would have been a very awkward animal on the ground because it still had capabilities for living in the trees, but certainly we're dealing with a biped here based off of the pelvis, how the um, the tibia is actually angled, um, and indeed how the foot looks. This is really interesting, this, this hay looks out to the side. It's been suggested that Artipithecus ramidus would essentially, we know that it lived in deciduous woodlands, sparse deciduous woodlands out on the savanna with these, in these patches of trees. So the idea is that Artipithecus ramidus was um, kind of a vertical clamberer. So it climbed around on the trees on its two feet, but was also capable of getting down and moving from patch to patch, uh, which I think is very fair. But let's talk about the Laetoli footprints. Um, Lucy was definitely a biped, 100%. These are the pelvises. Can you pick the odd man out, ladies and gents? Um, again, it's Pantroglodides. Here's Australopithecus afarensis. Um, uh, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. This is, of course, very outdated as a label, but we still do have these nice comparisons of the bones, which is, you know, kind of what matters. Then we also have a comparison of Pantroglodides, um, Australopithecus afarensis, and uh, Homo sapiens with how their valgus knee works, as well as the angle of the femoral head. How do they hold their weight directly underneath the body, very much like a modern human? Here's more comparisons of the pelvis and specifically some of the blades, which I like very much. Hold on. Okay, cool. And more importantly, this is an ex this is the fossil uh, little foot, STW573, which shows an inline halix. It's still slightly, you would call that semi-divergent because it's not totally uh, in line with the rest of the toes, but certainly more so than, than a chimp by several um, orders of magnitude, I would say. Here's a comparison of their femurs, which is a great way of telling how an organism held its weight. Who's the odd man out? Well, it's Pantroglodytes again, those rascally chimps always getting in the way. Uh, this is the stuff, by the way, that I've never seen the brain trust address. They don't actually look at how the bones operate and how like morphology has huge implications on function, like locomotion. Um, so that's really important. This is the paper that I was talking about that they never, ever discuss. All right. Uh, you'll notice that when Raw Matt presented the heat maps of weight bearing, he excluded that of the chimpanzee, which is very dishonest, by the way. Um, but you'll notice that there are huge similarities from the chimpanzee, right? And having this huge weight bearing still kind of in the in the heel to um, like the web, almost the webbing part. Um, up to where the halix would diverge, and this massive, awkward, full weight right here. The humans have the arch in the foot. We've got we've got a um, an arch in our feet that kind of allows shock absorption, right? So we've got what here is is an intermediate, right? Uh, another toe from Lucy that shows that it's uh, Australopithecus afarensis had these inline toes, and then this is the Laetoli footprints next to an Aboriginal footprint right here. Um, no, they're not identical. You, they, you know, since we're doing the the eyeballing method, since that's okay with raw mat, um, like I would treat a little baby, I could walk up to him with these two pictures and I could say, um, raw Matthew, which of these pictures is the human footprint? I know you can do it. And then I would wait patiently. And then he would, uh, you know, maybe eat some paste. And then he would point to this one right here. And then I would say, great job. And I'd give him a lollipop or something like that. But we also don't see him cover any of this, which actually took the took the actual scans of these footprints and analyzed them to show weight distribution and showed us that definitively this the whatever made the Laetoli footprints uh, again Laetoli footprints preserves the earliest direct evidence of human-like bipedal biomechanics, not human biomechanics, similar to human biomechanics, something that's walking upright. Um, but this is the one that really matters. This, dang it, this Laetoli footprints reveals bipedal gait biomechanics different from those of modern humans and chimpanzees. Because what that's telling us is that it's intermediate. A human didn't make these, but neither did a chimp. Um, and that's very problematic for creationists. Um, so Laetoli footprints, you get a big fat 
F on that one. Huge, big fail, epic fail. Um, you know, I, I don't know. So someone send me some aid. I need to go get like a glass. I have a bottle of wine over there that ooh, very tempting to, to take a look at. Admit you have a heat problem with regard to the events of the flood. Uh, excess re- geological, um, excess from geological events and radiometric decay. If you support CPT or provide solutions to the hydroplate issues, these guys are hydroplate bums. Let me tell you that. Uh, let's see what chat's doing real quick though before we hop into back into this. Okay, let's see. Yeah, everyone's saying it. 1996. Yeah, I know. Let's see here. Kyle Saltzman, they don't try to debunk evolution because of a lack of evidence. It's their fundamentalist agenda. It's, it's disgusting and an insult to all of science. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's fair. Um, it's not good. Let's put it that way. Hi, Otangelo. I can see you're still hanging out in the chat. Um, Otangelo is now back in the 20th century. Yeah. It, I, it's really interesting to see how Otangelo jumps around with the sources. You should see his geology sources. They come from like the 70s. Um, CRISPR Cast is funny. It's deeply funny that creationists think quotes are demonstrative of anything in science. You know, when we quote things in science, never. Sometimes before the science, never in the science. Yeah, true. Remember Rock State Old? Yep. Yeah, we're going to touch on that too. We're going to touch on that too. Um, let's discuss this heat problem thing because that's very glaring. So, okay. Creationists have a real issue with heat. They've got a huge heat problem. Uh, and when I say huge, I repeat this every time because I really want people to know and remember these numbers so that the next time you encounter a creationist, you can give them the numbers to just really, and watch those gears turn when you say the numbers, right? If you're a CPT proponent, you're dealing with a minimum of enough heat to vaporize the granitic crust about a double t- about a dozen times over um, of the earth. If you're taking the heat that results from 4.5 to 48 billion years and cramming it into 6,000. We're talking heat that results from the things like uh, mundane things, like how limestone hardens and releases heat, uh, the friction of the continents as they move about, and more most importantly, the radiometric decay that you have to just speed up. You have to cram all of that radiometric decay into a very small time frame. That's one of the biggies. But you've also got all of the impact events, all of the volcanism that we see traces of in the in the fossil record through its through its geochemistry. Um, and more and more and more. And the maximum of that, if you're taking the hydroplate idea, and I'm really, I've, I've just got to, oh, you, you, you really just have to appreciate this. It's enough heat to be equivalent to 1,000 trillion, one megaton H-bombs per square meter of ocean water for the entire duration of the flood. Um, so, yes, we do have a heat problem. Now, the funny thing is, I, when I made a hydroplate video a while back, I decided to go through because the, the big hydroplate proponent is Walt Brown. Those those numbers for the 100 or sorry 1,000 trillion one megaton H bombs, those come from Walt Brown's numbers for the energy that would have been released at minimum. Those are his numbers. He's the hydroplate guy. He gave those numbers. Brian Nickel, local YouTuber, he has tried to come up with these mitigation effects to say no 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 no. Uh, we're, we're not actually dealing with lethal amounts of heat because there would have been natural ways to get rid of it. Funnily enough, I released a video talking about the hydroplate mitigation uh, efforts called the heat problem, the OKO2 creationism. And I listed, I think I listed it down here for, for the sake of, um, yeah, for the sake of easy access. I listed the pro- the the problems with the mitigation, right? I, I kept down here, here's the problems with the mitigation efforts that you're using. For putty-like granite, which was something proposed as, as a way to reduce uh, friction, there's no observation or experiment to back that up. There's no observation or experiment for the uh, pillars of the earth. You can't suppose there's no earthquakes prior to the flood or you're breaking up these, these granitic granitic crust. You don't have the support for the tidal pumping that you need to break it. There are no fault line predictions. You can't explain the microfossils in the pre-flood rock. There's too much energy being released and ejecting everything because what they suppose is that all of the impact events that we have are the result of rocks being blown sky high and then falling back down and smacking into the earth. You don't have that energy. The fountains of the great deep, in order to launch those, are going to spray heat everywhere. You got a problem for that. There's, there's a failed mitigation there. There's not enough material on Earth to explain all the cratering and the still orbiting asteroids. I've not heard anyone touch this. 
Uh, there's too much energy in the re-energy of all of this ejecta. When it comes back in, that's more heat. That's still more heat. Space doesn't work as a heat sink. I covered that ad nauseum in this video and in all of these that Romat is listing here as dismantling the heat problem, these guys right here, and I know because I've watched them, space is still being listed as a heat sink. It doesn't work. This is what I'm saying when I say you didn't answer the question. I mean, you didn't answer it in the same way. And I used this example yesterday. You know, a little baby is sitting taking a test on, on uh, the, the Revolutionary War, right? And the question says, who is the first president of the United States? Uh, explain what they did for the country, some of the actions that they did for the country, and why that's important to our lives as Americans today. And Raw Matt toddles up to the paper, and he takes his big magic marker and scribbles George Washington with the backwards G and calls it a day. That's, that's what this answer to the heat problem is. They had Bob Enyart and Brian Nickel, the, the two guys who push Hydroplate on the most on their channel, and I showed up in the live chat and asked for numbers for these mitigation effects, and I got no numbers. They said we're working on it. That means that for now, your hypothesis is dead on arrival. It doesn't work, period. This question hasn't been answered. Um, and and he, he even says, Erica's response to these videos dismantling her arguments pertaining to the heat problem is by asking for the numbers. The video below has been ignored mainly because it is a technical response to Erica's arguments that goes thoroughly into all the assumptions and criteria when it comes to the global flood. I know which video this is going to be. Show it to me. Wait for it. Yeah, you see, because I've watched all of it. I'm in this live chat. I was in this, and I rewatched it from the beginning. They didn't cover the mitigation. Like, the, the heat sink is still being proposed in this video. Um, so, so, again, the, the question's not answered, not just because you don't have the numbers. That's the big problem. But also because you can't suppose that any of these mitigation effects air as an insulator doesn't work supersonic water coming from the cracks there's no observational or experimental work to suggest that that can even occur you need a devel nozzle to even get it to come out in the way that you want which has to be a very specific geological formation at every single part where the freaking fountains of the great deep open up in this idea um, you've got more heat from all the volcanism and friction. You've got the piezoelectric effect, which is used incorrectly and has not been shown to do what they need it to do in a laboratory setting, theoretically or otherwise. Z-pinch doesn't work. Uh, accelerated decay for heat doesn't work. We'll touch on that uh, more later. They have failed mitigation for that. Radiation damages all of life. Water doesn't protect you from that. And I covered that in this video. But my critiques aren't answered with additional critiques. A is true. What about B? A is true. That's every time what happens. Um, conflicting meteor dates becomes a problem. Sloping radiometric patterns becomes a problem. Non-radiometric corroboration is an issue. Electric field damage to life, something that is not touched on either. All of this is still an issue, okay? And I've brought it up to Stan for Truth, and his answer is, watch the videos. I did. They don't answer these questions. I even provided you an easy access list because I know Ramad is lazy. And he still doesn't do it. It's right here. You can even BS answers like you did for the barcoding thing. But nothing. Just we answered the questions. Eh, take it or leave it. We've also done an incredibly thorough debunking of Erica's arguments for the dating method. Yeah, we're going to talk about the dating method now, um, which is going to be really fun. Okay, so essentially, the existence of radio halos and fission tracks demonstrate that there was no heat problem. And whatever heat there was would have been done away with. How, Raw Matt? By a miracle? Are we finally getting miracle-pilled on the Brain Trust channel? Um, this doesn't work. If there was as much heat as the critics say there was, there would be no evidence for radio halos and fission tracks. First of all, heat has nothing to do with radio halos. And I know about radio halos because I covered them in my video. Um, again, B is what radio. my explanation for radio halos is. And then they just repeat, but A every time, which indicates rapid decay has occurred in the past. Nope, they don't indicate rapid decay has occurred in the past, and I'll, I'll show this to you in a moment. Andrew Snelling has pointed this out in his technical work. No, he's tried to, theoretically, um, but he can't actually show this to be the case, and radio halos have more issues that, that we'll say. It's laughable how triggered Erica is over how thorough we've been in addressing her work 
uh, from heat, and yet she's felt so miserably to answer the abiogenesis challenge. I haven't even tried to answer the abiogenesis challenge because I don't give a fuck about it, honestly. Um, that gives the absolute fatal blow to her starting point and basic presuppositions about naturalistic evolution. The irrefutable series found here. Um, this is like the same gag about naming yourself standing for truth. Like, if you say you're standing for truth, I'm immediately suspicious that that is not what you're standing for, right? Putting irrefutable makes me think, hmm, is he compensating for something? And as someone who's watched the video, I can tell you he is. Boy, is he ever. But let's talk about those radiometric issues that, um, you know, we'll go over my B again since we didn't actually get... Uh, anything more. I forgot to talk about this. Ramat has actually proposed many methods to delineate the kinds, and all of them have failed. Um, part, sometimes I'm the one pointing it out, sometimes someone else is. He's tried full genome, but that didn't work because humans and chimps are more similar than mice and rats. He tried genetic diversity, but that doesn't work because humans map well within the ranges that we see in other animals uh, and even other subspecies of hominids. Uh, spe single specific genes like FOXP2, this isn't standard or consistent or empirical. It doesn't work. Barcoding, as we showed here, it's inconsistent. It, if you're being consistent, it lumps humans with the other hominids. Uh, and mutation rates is the most recent one, which we also saw in this document. It's also inconsistent. It also lumps humans in with the other hominids when we're looking at the literature as a whole. So, raw mat, uh, game over on the on the on this particular attempt at delineate the kinds. Press X to try again. But let's talk about the radiometric dating problems real fast because we're gonna we're zipping through these. We're getting close to being finished. Fission tracks. That's the first one he mentioned. Creationists lack impair or lack examples from non-volcanically active areas, and creationists themselves admit that this is a problem. And Snelling's technical work on fission tracks, I think it was Snelling. I'm pretty sure it's Snelling. In his technical work, what he says is, yes, we have these fission tracks, and it's really difficult to actually use them for anything because they're in a very volcanically active and tumultuous area. I, I don't know, I can't remember for the life of me which one, it, I think it was by some caldera, right? And he was basically like, we don't know if annealing has occurred. We, you know, we find these 2 million year old dates for the fission tracks, but because it's in a volcanically active area and annealing, AKA heating up fission tracks resets them. Snelling in his own work has admitted the possibility, and when he says possibility, since the alternative is young earth creationism, this is likely what has happened, and conventional geology says that it is what happened, um, you get these fission tracks that have occurred in an area that repeatedly heats and deletes the fission tracks, right? It's like one of those, uh, it's like an etch-a-sketch. You etch a sketch and you shake it up, that's what happens when you add heat, the fission tracks disappear. So these fission tracks are dating to two million years old because they've had a heating event two million years ago. Polonium halos, po uh, correct? cracked material, which can let radon gas escape, essentially, um, and magma formation are the conventional answer to why we have polonium halos, and these are pretty well accepted. Um, moreover, and even more problematically, when you're dealing with polonium halos, there's actually more than one type of polonium halos. And Snelling supposes, and I think Baum Baumgartner does too, I, I mix up my creationist geologist, so I might be goofing this a little bit, suggests that, ah, yes, we see these polonium halos, um, the earth must be young because of the way that this that this gas has leached out of them and formed this nice halo around them and they show evidence for instantaneous creation but we only we only ever find one type of polonium halo not all three we know there are two other types we don't we don't find them because they have such a short half-life um and what that suggests to me is that the polonium halos that we have are a result of these naturalistic processes that we know do occur, because if it were instantaneous creation, we'd have all the kinds of polonium halos. Of course, Snelling doesn't touch this. Why would he? And finally, helium in the crust is something I suspected would be brought up, but of course hasn't. Um, and it's a very similar problem to the fission tracks issue. Uh, all of the examples given by the creationists are from incredibly uh, thermally unstable areas, right? And we know, like for instance, in the case of the Fenton Hills, that helium has contaminated rocks there before. The real question for all three of these radiometric dating is definitely accelerated problems, uh, is why aren't creationists just testing non-volatile samples? Why do they keep going to these volatile samples that are known to be volatile and testing them instead of something from like a super stable area? It's because they wouldn't get the answers that they want. They wouldn't get the answers that conventional geologists get and used to base and model and extract oil every single day to the tune of 500 or sorry 257 billion dollars a year annually that's the reason
radiometric dating makes the economy go round, baby. We're we're um we're based in money pilled on this one. <laughs> you know, it's this this is just like the dumbest. The, the dumbest thing ever, but we get something additionally dumb from this point of view too, because what he's saying is that because fission tracks are reset by heat, there can't have been a heat problem because we see fission tracks, assuming of course that the flood happened in this case. The actual equivalent to this is saying there couldn't have been a heat problem because things are alive today and the earth is still here. It, it doesn't follow. It's a non sequitur. It's baby logic, right? So your answer to providing or admitting to a heat problem, you get a big fat fail for this one too. So you've got one out of four, four or five, one out of four or five so far. Um, we're really in F territory already. Checking what everybody's doing in the chat. Yeah, everyone's dunking. You guys should dunk on these guys for sure. Yeah, Snelling in his own work. Which part of Jekyll and Hyde routine is this? Yeah, the real science part of the creationism science part. Yeah, Snell Snelling just uses conventional science when he's publishing in conventional journals. CRISPR Cas, let them have supersonic water. It still can't get to space. True. Yeah, true. I got a question for you on Twitter. Nestle Guy will be on Twitter shortly. Are we approaching the shadow zone territory? We are. We're getting really close to that. Mm. Okay. Let's let's bop back in here. Oops, this is something we don't care about. Okay, cool. All right, so one out of three. Yeah, it's it's laughable. Well, yeah, we did that already. Irrefutable lecture by Robert Stadler on the impost. I don't give two shits about that. Uh, Robert Stadler is also um, he provides hack fake definitions. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to one of the stupidest parts of this entire document. Radiometric dating falsified with observational science. If this is a statement, not a sentence. <laughs> I want you to picture two circles. One red, one blue. Red will represent uranium-238, and blue will represent uranium-234. Now cut that red circle in half in 20 minutes. Now do it again in 10 minutes, and then again in 5 minutes, and then again in 2.5, and going on until nothing is left. When nothing is left, it turns into a blue circle. That is how half-lifes work. That is how half-lifes work. That's how half-lifes work, he says. How do you get the definition of a half-life wrong when you're saying you're overturning radiometric dating? Y you can't make this up. This is a meme. This is a meme right here. Um, I pulled this up because I wanted to make sure I wasn't taking crazy pills from Khan Academy, talking about how a half-life does indeed work. <laughs> if the isotope has a half-life of two years, here's the percentage of the original you would have left after various amounts of time. From zero year, you still have all parent. Um, at two years, you've got 50%, right? Because the half-life is two years, the time that it takes to go from the original to half of the sample. And then you have half again, two years later, and then half again, two years after that, the time isn't changing. So what the fuck is Raw Matt doing here? He's incapable of understanding the first definition they teach you when you're learning about radiometric dating. And this alone tells us that we can take Raw Matt's document and use it to pick up our dog's crap when they go to the bathroom as we're walking out uh, about the town. It's that worthless. If you can't get the basics right, what are you doing submitting to PLOS biology, my friend? Um, I, I, I was flabbergasted by this. My, <laughs> my geology buddy actually read this and was like, is it because I'm drunk or because he's stupid? Um, and again, we're not going to make any claims about what we know about Raw Matt's intelligence, even though, I, again, I did call him a dumb bitch earlier. I'm sorry I called you a dumb bitch again, Raw Matt. Um, but this is really, really, really dumb to the degree that I am uh, speculating more, perhaps, than I should on his intelligence. Since Uranium-234, or rather, where are we here? However, we have only ever looked at later half-life rates 
wrong -o. That's not true in the slightest. We find rocks forming, igneous rocks, every day, and we see them with all parent material. This is without violation. Meaning until recently, we only ever witnessed, say, when blue circle, the blue circle, when the half-life, or when it was many half-lives over. Or we just noticed the blue circle and therefore conclude the red circle went through its entire constant half-life process. This is so stupid. Which would mean Earth is very old because the half-life here, uranium-238, is very old, or is very slow. I, I, I gotta see what chat's saying about this, because it, yeah. Yep, dumb bitch syndrome. I, I agree. Yeah. Yep, the entire document is centered. I'm scared to think of this, what the stupidest part may be. Yeah, CRISPR, what do you think about that? Okay. No words. True, Luca. No words. Wow, high school science, Phil. Yep, did his brain fall out? Because even I know how Half-Life worked. That's what I, th that's what I said. Because I don't know geology that well. I know it tangentially. But when I saw this, I was like, exactly what was said in the chat. I was like, we're experiencing some severe dumb bitch syndrome right here. Um, but, but the question is, is it stupidity? Or is it apathy towards anything truthful? I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, he he goes through this a bunch of times. You guys have heard me say this before. All right, let's see what he says. It's impossible here. Since uranium-234 occurs only indirectly from the decay of uranium-238, and now we know this can happen quickly. No, it can't. No, it cannot. However, when we noticed we actually saw blue circle form in the laboratory, it was rapidly decayed. Nope. Again, he presents no source for this, by the way, but no, you cannot speed up this decay. Decay rates don't speed up in meaningful ways in the lab or in nature over time. Um, a great book for that I actually happen to have on hand here. It's called The Bible Rocks in Time, and it's written by two Christian geologists who BTFO young earth creationism. They don't even give a shit about evolution. These guys are um, chads, I would say. Very alpha male energy going on here. Uh, I'm saying that to get, I, I know my view, my viewers are already alpha males, e even the girls. Um, everyone's an alpha male if you're in my chat. <laughs> um, yeah, th th this is insane, but let us continue. Uh, since it is impossible for anyone to say with certainty that these dec decay rates prove anything is millions or billions of years old, uh, to the extent that we can know anything, the law of radioactive decay isn't violated. So to the extent that we can know anything, the earth is billions of years old. Yes. Full stop. Um, and again, we, we have nothing, no sources, nothing is presented here to preclude that or to, to tell us why that isn't the case. It's beyond me how, say, this is again, it's like, I got a source, she goes to another school. Um, okay. All the initial assumptions we had regarding slow half-life decay have now been invalidated through observation it is not good, a good starting measurement of time. S citation needed, but also that's just factually incorrect. This is why when geologist Steve Austin, not that one, took samples from Mount St. Helens in 1986 and got them tested, he got 340,000 to 2.8 million years old. The formation of super heavy elements and cooling times play a factor in the dates they give as well as rapidly decaying down the periodic table of radioactive elements. Allow me to speak about that after I take a gratuitous sip of water. Hmm. I've said this before many times on this channel, but there is a method to the madness when it comes to science. And funny enough, funnily enough, curiously enough, we happen to know what elements we can date and what elements we can't, what minerals we can and what we can't, and with what elements, I suppose I should say. You can't date young, young, young rocks, even if they fall within the range of, of the uh, acceptable dates for um, kind of for your, uh, the, the, the elements that you're using. So let's say you're using potassium argon dating, even though potassium argon dating could like technically handle things at that really, really early end, you're, you're probably going to want to be really careful when you do that. And the reason is because when igneous rocks have just formed, they're all parent. And so weighing the daughter gives you results that are batshit crazy. The example that I always give is it's like trying to weigh a semi-truck on like a microgram scale. It walks out. There's, there's no way to measure it. What you can do, though, is take that fact, which we know to be the case, and say, okay, what if then 
we look at the date of something that does a known date of something that does fall within the range of something we we want to use radiometrically um look within a radiometric range appropriate radiometric range and we've done that you can look at ancient volcanoes like mount or not Mount St. Helens like um, Mount Vesuvius which erupted when of course humans were around and was the the um the demise of Pompeii and uh, Herculaneum I think was the other one you can take the known eruption date of that mountain volcano and you can test it with radiometric dating and when we did that allowing there to be even the slightest amount of daughter material we got accurate dates so you can date volcanic rock of known ages it just has to have had enough time for there to be daughter elements to measure and that's why any time anyone brings up mount saint helens to you walk away it's not worth the conversation. Or if they're your friend, you can explain to them kindly how radiometric dating works. Of course, I've done that for the brain trust multiple times and they have never let it sink in. Again, no thoughts, head empty. That's that's what we're dealing with here. Nothing is capable of being retained. But then we get this beautiful sentence right here. Here is another thing. Why are low layers dated older? Well, uranium is a very heavy element and it sinks to the deepest, and it also dates the oldest. Easily explained. Does anyone want to guess why that's the dumbest, one of the dumbest things that's that's been listed in this chat? If you know anything about the subject, you know this, is, this should be reversed. We should have young bias towards the bottom if this is indeed the case, based off of how uranium decays. Ramat can't even get the basics right. The bare minimum eludes him entirely. The bar exists in the basement on the floor. Not even there. Someone's dug a, a, a comically large trap door and dug even deeper past the basement and set it down there. That's what we're doing. The bar's so low and he can't even he can't even do the bare minimum. This is the level of incompetence that we're dealing with here. All right, so uh, the, the, this, yeah, this is a nice half-assed response right here. Provide a valid reason to suspect the law of radioactive decay can be violated. He just goes, why would it be? <laughs> yeah, why, why would it be violated? Excellent question. It's clear as dated above, once heavy elements cool, they rapidly decay, then cool, then stabilize. Nope, wrong, as I, as I stated before. Hmm. I suspect we will get a, but my polonium halos answer again. Then begin to decay at observable constant rates we see today. No complicated, no, not complicated and no law is broken. Then you don't know what the law of radioactive decay is, Ramat. That it's that simple. That simple. Of course, he's not going to watch this video. He's in two shits what I have to say. Um, and I don't really care what he has to say either outside of the comedic value that it provides me and you. Um, of course, I will be paying for blood pressure medication down the line. Let's see what Chad is up to. Mm. Yep, Rayward, that's exactly it. Thank you. Okay, Nestle 20 The question on Twitter is a funny question. I'd love to see your live reaction. Yeah, I can do that. I can do that real quick. <laughs> Travis Tomlin, easily explain. Yeah, true. Very true. Yeah, Gorilla from Woody. True. Yeah, gorillas are awesome. I think CRISPR says, I think he formats documents like a blind man on acid guessing. Yeah, it's probably pretty close to that. Okay, we'll we'll take a quick Twitter break and see what Neslik says. It's gonna be funny. He's promising laughs. I don't actually know Neslik, but they are promising laughs. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> Anyone feeling this the same way I do? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with, I, I feel that. Uh, good meme, my friend. Enjoyable meme. Okay, let's continue. This is another really stupid one. This one hit me hard. This one felt like I someone walked up to me and just punched me in the stomach. Um, I ask, explain how mass extinction events can be explained geochemically. And then raw mat lists mega sequences. Anyone want to anyone want to take a stab at how those aren't the same thing? Because they're not. The, meg, the the five mega sequences are not like 
the geochemical signature signatures of mass extinction. Like someone doesn't look and say, ah, yes, the Kelwasser mega sequence. That's not how this works. Hmm. These are explained by the CPT model. Roman, you just you subscribe to Hydroplate. Why are you even bringing this up? So why ask when you know that we do not view these five extinction events, but rather five stages of those slide? That's the point. So each mass extinction, as detailed in another book you guys should read, I'm, it's, I've got a very co convenient collection of books right here, called The Ends of the World by Peter Brennan, discusses the nature of the geochemical signals and how we know how each mass extinction went down, from isotopic ratios to paleo environments, the states of volcanism, ash layers, iridium, things of that nature. And the flood cannot do that, okay? Iridium, for instance, uh, this is the go-to example of mine for, for this particular issue. Iridium is an element that exists primarily in meteors, right? It's, it's, it's an extraterrestrial element in the sense that it's found in very low quantities here on Earth. Occasionally, you can get some from volcanism. I've heard that as an argument from creationists before, but not to the degree that we need it. And we can find a band of iridium that separates the very last dinosaur fossil from everything else, everything subsequent. Because iridium was a massive part of the asteroid that smacked on down in the Yucatan Peninsula and killed everything, right? And we have this enormous gas cloud that essentially spread all over the planet, and that's how we end up with this iridium layer everywhere. You find it everywhere, without exception. This doesn't make sense over a global flood context, okay? This doesn't work in the sense of the global flood because you've got to have that impact event occurring. You've got to have nothing else settle quickly for, to allow that iridium to lay down in a, in a complete layer. And then you've got to have everything resume. It doesn't make any sense. The Permian is another issue. There's, there's no way to explain away the Siberian traps. The Siber Siberian, I always mix it up. Is Siberian Permian Siberian traps? Might be the Deccan traps. Please tell me Permian. Please tell me I was right. Yeah, Permian. Five five hundred million years. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, Siberian traps. Okay, good. I always second guess myself on that. Um, we've got continents like like a, a country's worth of flood basalt during the middle of the global flood. That doesn't work either. Those geochemical signals exist and they're problematic. It, it, Twelve kilometers thick of flood basalt in the middle of the flood doesn't make any sense. You've got the issues of massive ocean acidification resulting in changes in how the limestone deposits. That can't be explained by the global flood. We've got massive fluctuations in um, in atmospheric oxygen. Can't be explained by the global flood. And, and we've got this flipping like crazy. Like it's it's flipping like a, like a hip, I don't know, like a break dancer. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's going back and forth. Anoxic um, and, and uh, very deprived of oxygen to super oxygenated. Um, over and over and over again. We've got magnetic fluctuations occurring over and over and over again. We've got glaciation events, the, the, the likes of which are changing the entire global temperature um, and resulting in, in glaciation that creeps down from the poles. All of this takes time to occur. It takes time to arrive and it takes time to subside. You can't have it during the global flood. You just can't which is why no creationist has ever attempted to explain the geochemical signatures in the order that we find them. There are indeed five mass extinctions, and we can tell because we can compare um, the, the animals prior to the, the geochemical signatures, and then after. And what we have is a huge extinction event. That's why it's called a mass extinction. So no, this is not an answer. That's another thumbs down. So we've got one answer, and this was a thumbs down too, by the way, Way. So we've got one single answer so far, attempt at an answer. That was fine. It didn't work, but it was at least an attempt at an answer. ERVs. This is this is another good one. Let's let me check and see what chat's doing. What do we got going on here? Yeah, and Andy Lord, I just love the idea that one mega sequence just sits there lithifying, waiting for the next stage of the flood to be laid down, while the first one is like, it's still, is like still fucking flooded. Yeah, true. Guess all the mega fun and missed the boat. True, basic trigonometry. Yeah. Is this document, this document docs IQ points by the second by Mikel Koenig? Yeah, it, it, it does. I, I warned you. This is why you needed to bring um, alcohol. Kudos to you for not reaching for that wine yet. I'm this close, man. I am so close to it. I, I'm getting more and more frustrated every time. Hey, an attempt to answer is at least, or is all you can hope for sometimes. That's true if it's an honest attempt. But like the mass extinctions are known 
by people, right? Like listing mega sequences. This is like being asked to uh, give the multiples of nine and you like count to three as the answer. Like technically they're numbers, technically mega sequences are geology. They're just not what's being asked for in the slightest. Um, I think Speed is hosting an after show, FYI. Oh, cool, Speed, I will try to make it. Rayward, I bet there's a ton of limestone in those mega sequences that literally cannot be laid. I'm doing a video on limestone because limestone is a single mineral precludes the global flood, uh, full stop. In fact, one of um, LPP, John Maddox's friends, uh, Argotha, and I <clears throat> got into it over on one of LPP's after shows the other day. And I was basically like, yeah, you, you got this huge problem in limestone. And then we didn't get to finish the conversation. So he said, email me. So I did, and I haven't gotten an email back yet because I was very thorough. <laughs> I forget the bloody alcohol. I'm about to start screaming. Yeah, Joe D, I agree. Because what we're dealing with is a is a level of dumb that is incomprehensible. This is why it's like, I'm of the school that it's like, don't bully standing for truth and raw mat. Don't go over there and brigade their stuff. Don't do it. I'm dead serious. But if they show up here, feel free to ask them why they're being so stupid. Um, I'm okay with that. If they come here, all bets are off. Hmm. Next question. I asked them to present arguments against the consensus nature of endogenous retroviruses, orphan genes, in relation to humans and other apes, as well as human chromosome 2. Of course, we don't get anything for human chromosome 2, I can tell you right there, but let's read about what he has to say about ERVs. For those of you who don't know, endogenous retroviruses are essentially found viral material that is, that is embedded in the human genome and doesn't really do much. Sometimes it does things, but usually it doesn't do much. And if it does do things, well, there's a reason it's stuck around. You call that natural selection. <clears throat> so he says, ERVs are considered ancient virus invaders that were predicted to be a part of junk DNA that would have zero function. They were thought to have zero function, but that was not a bold prediction that was made. People were like, oh, hey, they're ERVs. They don't appear to be doing anything. And then some people were like, but maybe they are. Let's look into it. Again, soap opera brain going on. Why would they, right? Yeah, that, that was that was kind of the thinking. The word virus means toxic or poison. Don't give a shit. And that is how most evolutionists perceive them. Nope, wrong. However, if 50% of our DNA is made up of viral elements, I don't know that that stat is true. Wouldn't that indicate that they might be essential genetic elements and that these viral elements might just be another part of regulatory network in the organism? This is like baby step, baby step, baby step, baby step. Trebuchet launch. That's that's what just happened in, the, in this series of sentences, um, which is batshit as usual. But what else do we expect? Um, no, you wouldn't expect that. Not in the slightest. The majority of the genome is junk DNA um, in the sense that it might be transcribed, but it doesn't do anything. And most of it isn't even transcribed, right? It, it it's junk DNA. We know this in part because we've sequenced the genome and in part because of the work done by like Grauer et al. in 2017. But we also know it because we've done knockout tests on other organisms, like mice, for instance. You can knock out 50% of the genome of the mouse. Knock it out. Get rid of it. And this mouse can still reproduce and have little bitty mouse babies. And then its babies can have babies, which means that the genes you're knocking out aren't doing anything. They're junk. So Yes, we know <laughs> that the genome is not fully functional. Usually what's proposed here is the work of ENCODE, which was a, a, a group of scientists that really did awesome work. And as a side note, they were also like, yeah, 80% of the human genome is functional. But then their definition of function was like, is transcribed. Um, so it's like, that's not really a good definition of function. And I can say that as someone who doesn't know genetics very well, other geneticists say that all the time, and ENCODE was heavily criticized when they first came out and said it. And then members of ENCODE were also like, yeah, it was a bad definition. So no, we do know most of the genome isn't functional. Some of it is, most of it's not. Some ERVs are, are functional. They've been incorporated into doing stuff in the genome. Most aren't. And that's stuff I've provided sources for in the past. They know these sources, they don't care. So let's continue here. <laughs> This is just another case of why evolutionary based science, evolutionary based science is a menace to scientific research. Never take a vaccine again, Ramat. Of course you wouldn't because you're an anti-vaxxer, but get out of here. You don't deserve antibiotics either because those are done on principles of, of selection and evolution. Get out. We don't need you. You know, whatever. This is insane logic. 
discovery and progress. Man, start off with that. Get out of here. Hmm. We believe they are built in as functional DNA elements, and without them, we would not do well. Does the body supply these with ATP? Yes. Why would the body ever waste vital energy on useless junk? It it still does waste energy on useless junk. I just explained how it does. It would not. It does. <laughs> you see, once they know dysfunction in the RVs, they invoked, they invoked, they must have gained the incomprehensible gibberish, by the way function out of the sheer number of them inside of us another rescuing device that doesn't make sense at all that doesn't make sense at all just just delete everything else just leave this <laughs> that's fine so we know that these guys are viruses these ervs are viruses one because they look like viruses in the sense that their sequence identity is is viral in nature when i say they look like viruses in a genetic sense that means usually it's a sequence thing. It's not saying something looks like something in paleontology, right? Those two animals are quite different. They look like viruses, but they also act like viruses. And I've presented this paper on the xenotransplantation of ERVs um, in pigs. And we find out that when you transplant an ERV from one organism to an organism it doesn't belong in, if there's enough of it to do so, it starts acting like a virus again. I've given them these, these papers before. They don't care. Expression of blah, blah, blah. This is him basically being like, look, sometimes ERVs do things. Yes, they do. No one has ever said that, that they didn't. Why would anyone even think for one second this is a not a created element designed because people aren't stupid and they're capable of reading papers? Stu Sorry, let me clarify. They're not stupid or lazy. I don't know which raw mat is. And at long last, we, and then he lists, a, he's just shills and plugs again and again and again. Also, please see that's not a real paper. Evidence, that's not a real paper. The design of life, nope, not not uh, a real paper. Look, all of them are creation research. Get out of here, dude. Get out of here. Okay. The koala virus, I do like that. Um, okay. This is the last question, thankfully. And I know CRISPR is going to have a real fun time because we do discuss Parsons a little bit here. But I'm going to take this opportunity, one, to close some tabs. Um what was this that I was just looking at? Oh yeah, this is, I remember this. I can delete that. That's Twitter. I can delete Twitter for right now. I don't want to close down StreamYard, so we already covered Half-Life, so we can get rid of that. Chat. Here's the beautiful chat. Word salad with a side of dishonesty. Yeah, true. CRISPR says junk doesn't mean non-functional anyways. Yeah, that's true too. Okay. And Rue the Dot says, I'm extremely glad you're going to do one on limestone. Yeah. The limestone stuff is insane. They, they've been bitching and moaning about limestone because I commented about it on an LPP stream. And I'm pretty convinced at this point that when I appear somewhere, one of the members of the brain trust finds it and makes a point to respond to it, which whatever, I don't really care. You're welcome and free to do that. But yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's a little bit, uh, well, it's excessive. My last statement was to justify the work of Nathaniel Jeanson. Oh, right. ERVs um, fail. You did not do that. Also notice they didn't touch orphan genes and they also didn't touch chromos human chromosome two. Fail on all those parts. Down, down, down. Also, I think he's here right now, which is really funny because uh, I'm one of these anonymous or one of you are here and, and enjoying this as well. Yeah, so I asked them to justify the work of Nathaniel Jeanson from broken mutation rates in the mitochondria to Y chromosome and uh, Y chromosome and the Y chromosome to nonsensical, uh, nonsensical population predictions, basically convinced me Jensen is a legitimate researcher who is honest and in good faith, as well as why the assessment, my assessment of his work is not correct, that it's garbage. And I also said his work on mtDNA and Y chromosomes does nothing to support young earth creationism. In fact, it takes the light that previously bathed creationism in outdated ignorance and changes it to one of potential intentional deceit. All of those things are still true. In fact, the interview that David Neff and Creationist had last night, which the link I'll put in the description, details another reason why Jensen's work is worthless and, and um, should be considered as such. Uh, but I suspect we won't get anything other than uh, Ding et al. was wrong on that too. So Jensen's prediction on mtDNA rates and Y chromosome using the highest quality ever discovered is bad for YEC because, okay, that's just not what the situation was. Um, he's going to argue that Parsons is the best paper ever for this. Parsons is wrong. Okay, I don't care that Parsons thinks that he's right. No one besides Nathaniel Jensen uses Parsons' work for anything that isn't forensic science. Period.
Okay, that's that's just the true statement because he's a forensic scientist. I'm sure he's done great forensic science work. I think his um, his some of the pedigree mutation stuff has been done used by the FBI. That's usually the thing that these guys put forward. But in the same way that I know a lot about monkeys, but I would do horrible if you tried to get me to talk about like flatworms, right? You can't take someone and put them even in a tangential field and expect them to know how to do it to the degree of the field they were trained in. Okay, well, no real argument was weighed other than slander. No, you didn't watch the video. You didn't watch the interview. If you think that the only point was slander, then you weren't watching. Um, and, and I don't owe it to you to explain it to you here. You can go and watch the video if you're not going to actually answer the questions. Again, it's just a waste of my time. So I guess I'll just state that Jensen's mutation rate is in line with other, peop other pedigree studies, including Parsons. No. Again, that's also just not the case. You can clearly see Parsons lands on 6,500 years. His error bars are insane. His error bars cover, correct me if I'm wrong, Christopher, but he's got like, like a million year error bar. And then they just pluck out 6,500 years and say, well, it's in the error bar technically, so it works. Um, and the minimum argument was like a thousand years ago, like the minimum range was like that humanity began a thousand years ago, which is very funny. Um, and they just pluck one out very, very weirdly. Erica's argument that neither the FBI nor Parsons could identify blood. Nope. <laughs> that, that I never, I didn't say that. Nope. Again, like this is just so, then he, he shows Parsons. This is just an email or a DM, I guess, from between Parsons and Ramat, where Parsons gets mad that people are still bitching about his uh, 1998 paper, which they are because it's not good for anything outside of forensic science. Is CRISPR losing his mind in chat right now? Yeah, he is. 1970, not years ago, disco. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's more like cheese grossing from Ren and Stimpy. Yeah, true. That's that's how I feel here, too. It's me. How, LOL. It's, okay, it's Kyle Saltzman. Okay. That's funny. Sorry. I, I'm i so I'm so um, bathed in the bad faith of Raw Matt. I thought that he was uh, getting it. Mikhail Kodak, would you say the brain trust is obsessed with you? I would say that, actually. For whatever reason, my comments in particular really get under their skin. Uh, I don't know why that is, if it's just because I'm younger um, or because I'm right or because my arguments are, um, like, well-researched. Like, I do, I'm not trying to, like, you know, dote on myself, but, like, I I source what I say. I don't know if that's the reason or what, but, yeah, mm, I think that they probably are a little bit. If, if the, you'll remember my community post from a while ago were, like, 20 videos of the past 30 or whatever had my name in them or had to do with me in some way. That's an exaggeration, but it was something close to that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that obsessed is probably a fair thing to say. Uh, I wish they would stop. I, I don't think it's healthy, but you know, I do slander them a lot. I I am I am obsessed with busting bad science, though. So I do try to cover people who aren't just the brain trust, because God knows there are a lot of them. Um, yeah. So Parsons being mad about I I don't care what Parsons has to say. Like his his work is fine. It's just not. It doesn't work for what Jensen's using it for. Um, yeah, Howl et al. is interesting because Howl et al. has a really great paper from like 2003, and CRISPR actually pointed this out to me, uh, about how pedigree rates and phylogenetic rates are inherently different. Um, pedigree rates are always going to be faster. Of course, this isn't something Jensen noticed or commented on, but whatever. Um, he did a nut, blah, blah, blah. Okay, he's just showing more screenshots that I don't really care about. Both of our studies in Parsons come to a remarkably similar conclusion. I don't know when this is from. Again, like Ramad is allergic to sourcing anything. So, and then he's talking about all this. You can see my video. I, I don't feel like honestly going through all of the Jensen stuff again because it's been done to death. Um, I will say that Jensen takes pretty much nothing into account selection wise. He extrapolates a pedigree rate instead of considering that phylogenetic rates have to be taken into account by definition over long periods of time because of how selection works. But again, he's not taking any kind of selection into account. Both of those are issues. Using Parsons is an issue because Parsons has insane methodology. And best of all was the, the incredible work done by David Neff and Creation Myths, who very recently reached out to the linchpin paper of Nathaniel Jensen's mitochondrial mutation rates, Ding et al. And Jensen had said in his work, if what we're dealing with, like he's looking at his the difference between dramatic and, and somatic or uh, germline and somatic. And he's basically like, I 
think it was, what it was, I think he assumed that they were germline mutations. And he was like, yeah, it's germline, we're good. And Neff reached out to him and was like, all right, um, what if it turned out that ding at all, it wasn't germline? What if it turned out it was somatic or a mix of germline and somatic? And Nathaniel Jensen responded to him. You can find all this on Creationist channel. Like the, they, they show the receipts, right? And um, and Jensen responded and essentially said, well, we have good reason to think that it's germline. But yeah, if it was a mix, that would be bad. Then they asked Ding et al. And Ding et al. was like, yeah, we weren't measuring germline rates. Um, that wasn't what the paper was about. And there's good reason to believe that it was germline and somatic mix, which just... That's all she wrote, folks. That's just taking the, the foundational card from the genes in house and calling it a day. So of those many reasons, I don't care about any of this methodology because I've covered it already before. But for those many reasons, Jensen is not worth the time and he's a bad researcher uh, and he's dishonest um, and he's a snake oil salesman and a huckster and a grifter. Um, and yes, all of that is slander. So allow me to rephrase it in such a way that those things I just said he was are my opinion. I think he's all those things. Wink. In Minecraft. Um, <laughs> so now you can see why some, okay, whatever. Then he says, now the argument against Parsons is that the AFDIL forensic samples were faster than the rest. But no, that's not the only argument. There are a bunch of different arguments, but whatever. He just goes through Parsons and he's trying to be like, hmm, Parsons is good. Um, but again, I've gone over why Parsons is not. And none of this, because I read it before, actually goes into explaining uh, or going into the critiques that myself and CRISPR, because I interviewed CRISPR in the chat. CRISPR's got a background in this. Um, and I, I, CRISPR and I had a lovely chat as to why Parsons doesn't work and why Jensen is bad in general. That was then even more dogpiled on by creation this video last night. And none of what we said was addressed in this. So for this question, you didn't answer it. That's one question answered and whatever, eight, seven or eight that were not. And then he goes, another incomplete sentence. Convince you that Jensen is a legitimate researcher. Why? Are you, you are convinced of nothing ever from what I can tell, but okay. No, I'm not convinced of anything with regard to YEC because YEC is so frequently dishonest and uninformed. I'm not convinced by anything of YEC. I'm convinced constantly of conventional science opinions that I have, whether I'm convincing myself further that yes, I, I am indeed correct on this or that I was so off base that it's ridiculous, right? I mean, like I, I get convinced of this stuff all the time. That's that's good practice is to have an open mind, um, but not YEC. They've got too poor of a track record and every single time that I've looked into it, it's turned out to be either incorrect um, or dishonest in some way. So that's my experience. Then he goes, message him on Facebook. He replies within days, funny. Dan messaged him on Facebook two times, Dan of Creation Myths, and invited him to come and defend himself on the show last night. And Jensen left him on red. Mm, he's really into that open science. You gotta love that open discussion. Then challenge him on what he's challenged anyone to do. People have tried, he won't answer. He might answer young of Creationists, he doesn't answer challengers, because he's gotta get it past Big Daddy Ken Ham first. Article by SFT debunking crit uh, critics on the topic. Uh, I've also written an entire book debunking you're a breatharian raw matt you're an ex-breatharian like i i'm sorry i'm not buying another book by these guys i already have one i'm still like covering it and now we finish as you can see erica and team dodgeball have resorted to massive damage control and we must admit it's quite entertaining um i would say that this is an entertaining exchange for sure that being said Okay, let's see here. Got to get to the end of this. Because I want you guys to see. I think Rational Mind did a great job summing this up. Um, yeah, entertaining for sure. I don't think we find, it's funny, the find it funny for the same way. So um, what you have here are like a group of YouTubers who are claiming that they've debunked the foundational aspect of biology. And they do absolutely nothing to actually get that out into conventional science. And I understand why, because people better than them have tried and failed to do so. All of AIG, all of ICR, all of creation.com, all these guys, they've got entire foundations dedicated to protecting this worldview of young earth creationism. 
and they're more irrelevant than ever today. So that's that's the long and short of it. Why not just why not just grift and make money um off of this as a concept? Uh, it's just you know I don't know. I, I think that it's uh very it grows more transparent by the day, and um we'll we'll cover this by uh rational mind if we can get it to show it's probably gonna be an ad because jackson does make the big bucks um on youtube jackson Wheat does so these videos there they're also very impressed by how jolly scientific the video all right dang it ad again this is ruining my big finish rock six i do like that okay yeah he doesn't have a clue how to interpret it even though it's well written and entirely clear. All of this is lost on the adoring creationist viewers of these videos though. They're also very impressed by how jolly scientific the videos are. When your primary audience doesn't know any better, it's easy to see why Raw Matt and Standing for Truth put so little effort into getting things right. As long as they can keep pumping out videos with a scientific veneer, 44 videos in the last month alone, they can get the same praise from the same small group of fans. I was planning to end the video here. And I, I think that that sentiment holds. Um, I wanted to play it because I, when I was looking up the barcoding stuff, I, that struck me as incredibly accurate still. And that was months ago. They're still getting the same things wrong. They're still putting out a billion videos over the course of a month that cover the same topics, have the same guests, and are all varying degrees of incorrect, um, but a similar degree of, of a waste of time. Um, but they never do anything substantial. You know, like none of the guys that they have on do either. I mean, like this is shade on Raw Madden standing for truth, but it's also shade on like the guys that they have on who are also just doing Amazon publishing. Um, so yeah, I, I you know, my my uh, way of kind of finishing this um, and giving my last thought before we check in with Chad and then kind of close this down is I am not going to do any more videos about standing for truth's channel. I'm, I'm not doing any more of them. I know, listen, other than the <laughs> other than the library of errors, I am going to finish that. But I'm not doing any other video for the Standing for Truth channel um, unless I get a video that is a single video that answers my critiques, both in this video and answers the questions that they didn't answer in the original one. So the critique for the one question they did answer and the original questions in the original video. Um, and, I, and the reason I'm making that the stipulation is because hmm, it's never going to happen. I'm not going to get a video that answers my questions. And if I do, the risk, of course, is that I'll just use conventional science to roast it again and, and show why it's incorrect. Because these guys can't get the, the facts right. They can't get the, the, the mechanisms right. They can't support their worldview. And they won't just be miracle-pilled and admit that they've got to invoke some crazy shit to get it to work. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not doing any more videos about Standing for Truth other than the Library of Errors until I get um, a an actual video, a single video, not a shit ton of videos, not a playlist, um, because Standing for Truth very much relies on overwhelming people with content, and most of it's filler. And I know that because, again, I have watched them. I listen to them while I run, and it gives me jet fuel. Um, yeah, I, and I don't think we'll get such a video. Uh, and in fact, I'm I'm out on really interacting with these guys until we see an actual change in behavior. And I was like one of the last ones to see it again, you know, and like standing for truth can be a really nice guy. He really can. Um, he can be a really sweet guy. He's got good taste in movies, um, but he platforms some of the most dishonest people I've ever seen in my life. And he himself is incredibly wishy-washy on his attitude towards this whole thing. He's a very inconsistent person with, committing to things like uh, he said he'd get go on Dan's channel and do the um, cross-examination that Dan gave, like offered to him the other day. I don't think we'll see him on there. Um, I, I just don't think, he said he'd do Dan's evolution challenge. He never did that. Um, and, yeah, and, and he told me he'd make a video response, a single video response to my questions in the first place. And I didn't get that either. So yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm tuckered out on this topic, but the grand total is one question was attempted to have an answer, right, it, it, out of all of them. And the rest were half-assed, pathetic, and embarrassing attempts that were mostly rehashes of old statements uh, that ultimately amounted to nothing new. Um, and so let me check with the chat and see what's going on today. 
Oh god, I don't know. Faithful, honest, and true is in the chat. That guy doxes people like crazy. They might just be pretending to be nice so you so they won't look mean from Beowulf. Yeah, I've been I've been told before that when I'm nice to people, like they they tend to be nice back. Um I mean, when people are nice to people, they tend to get it in turn. But yeah, I, I think that that's probably fair. Chris Cass says his forensic work was fine as a pro. Yeah, agreed. Um, Gar Gargle says, FYI, your description reads the brain trust is, has not. Yeah, I don't want to pull it on that. Thank you for saying that. Say it ain't so true. Um, Michael Koning says, I thought 10 bottles of 100 proof were enough. Clearly I was wrong. Yeah. Um, Christians are almost as confused concerning the English language as they are basic biology. Thank you, Kyle. Agreed. Um, Michael Kennedy says we need to get guts to get in to be the one making the big bucks one of these days. Listen, I'm, I'm in it for making creationist busting channels that are slowly transitioning into being more science-based, just cool science content. Like I, that's what I want. I want that to be the hip, cool thing. Let's get more science vlogs into the, <laughs> into the public domain. Beowulf says maybe they're more irrelevant than ever before, but we're still having debates about evolutionary biology in middle school in central Georgia. Yeah, the South is a different story, but thankfully most of the world has moved on. You know SFT will get under your skin enough for you to respond again eventually from Mikel Koning. Don't call me out like this. <laughs> Rue from the dot. Thank you for another fun stream. Thank you for being here. Ugly German truths. I'm si I am sufficiently assured that they do not know the conventional science as they did never bother to look outside their creationist box. Yeah, I, I feel like I've shown convincingly that they don't know what they're talking about um raw mat at least very very least doesn't jolly good job from command cyborg the sheer cost of face palm uh, protection for going through all the yeah, i know michael Koenig simp for science i simp for science big time dude i'm i'm yeah i simp for science like crazy let me think is there anything else that i wanted to cover no that's it thank you for being here this was a very fun time for me um the next time we do one of these again i'm hoping to get a video out on the mycene apes I was hoping to do that this week. It may be more towards the weekend. I want to do something too on the Triassic Extinction, continue those two series on. Um, and I think that'll be it. So let me get over here to ready to shut down the stream. And thank you so much for being here, my gentle and modern apes. Please stay safe. Um, and don't forget to like and comment and hit the bell and all that stuff. Bye-bye.